Well, again, thank you for joining me today. Uh, today, the space is kind of as part of my attempt to uh, review as many companies as possible and add value to the community on Twitter and on YouTube. Um, my handle is uh, Razor Oil on both, on Twitter and YouTube. And today we'll talk about Atabasca Oil. And um, we'll, we'll learn about this company and kind of see why they outperform uh, on relative basis in the last uh, couple of years. Um, I'm not a financial advisor, so uh, obviously nobody should listen to me on anything here. I'm, I'm a, I am a technical guy, though. And uh, this is um, uh, going to be more from an educational point of view. Uh, to educate about the asset, to really explain uh, what I think is happening. Everything I'm going to share is from the public domain. So all the slides, all the basically uh, AER uh, presentations, uh, corporate slides, uh, some financials. Uh, I'm going to do kind of deeper dive towards what others are saying about this company and, uh, and just kind of go from there. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to share here, and, and again, if you guys confused about where I'm sharing, uh, I'm going to share um, uh, slides on YouTube Live and Twitter Live. So, all right, here we go. All right. So, one second, present, share screen. Okay, so right now the viewers will see um, uh, relative performance. I picked uh, just kind of randomly uh, four companies here just to, to show relative performance for those companies. And uh, I'm looking at right now at the Tabasca, Meg, uh, Tamarack Valley, and uh, Tourmaline. Um, obviously, Tourmaline um, is not really comparable, but uh, just kind of for reference, to show where we stand. So in one year, uh, Tabasca did about 3.7%, uh, Meg did seven, uh, Tamarack is down 33% and Tourmaline is down 10%. Now Tourmaline paid some dividends here, so it's not really reflective of their performance. So they've probably done well over the past year. As we look at six months performance, uh, Tabasca gained 25% in the last six months. And make 13 percent. Uh, Tamarack is down about 24 percent, and Tourmaline is down uh, 14 percent, but does not include uh, basically the um, um, the dividends. And so I think, like when when I talk about that performance, that's that's kind of what I mean here, is that uh, there there is probably a reason here why the market uh, recognized that the company is. Uh, perhaps maybe undervalued in, in relative, in relative performance. And what are some of the reasons why I've done relatively well? And so this is something we're going to examine today and try to understand. As you can see in the past three months, though, uh, the performance been slightly down, where uh, let's say Atomarak was down 17%, uh, Tabasco was down 4%, Meg was flat essentially, and Tourmaline actually gained here about 8%. So all of, all of that stuff in, is on a relative basis. If we look at three-year, um, uh, obviously, Tavaska is like up uh, 12 times, Meg up four times, uh, Tamarack up uh, 280%, and Tourmaline up 400%. So, so there is an element here of like, what does it mean even the relative outperformance? On a 10 year, uh, Tavaska is down 58%, where Tourmaline is up 46%. So, again, those time frames are, are very important to, to understand. So, right now, I'm going to talk a little bit about what others uh, are saying on BN and Bloomberg. And, um, you know, every, so everything I share here is from the public domain. What others are saying about this company? So recently, um, end of April, and Dennis De Silva, he was on BN and Bloomberg, and he's, he's somebody asked him about it, the basket mag, and uh, whether he should uh, own um, uh, at Tabasco or Meg, and he said, don't buy any of those companies, right? Uh, he doesn't own either. Uh, he likes light, light oil here. Um, he would prefer Meg because it's larger market cap, a better liquidity and institutional ownership. Uh, Atabasca is more focused on that, that reduction. I think he kind of, in a way, in a way he 
nailed the debt reduction argument here. And I think that's one of the reasons why they've done so well, because last year through the cycle, as the oil prices were declining from 120 uh, and others were busy paying dividends and maybe buying back shares while maintaining high levels of debt, uh, Atabasco were busy uh, reducing significant amount of debt. So we're going to be seeing that as well. Um, he mentioned also that they do buybacks, but he prefers dividends for income. Um, Rocky stock performance. Well, well, I could one could argue about that uh, comment because you've done extremely well relatively to other energy names, but uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, his uh, his comment about buybacks is uh, is correct because um, uh, once uh, they basically committed now to 75% of the free cash flow return, is going to be going to see in the presentation to to give it kind of back uh, to investors. All right, so right now, uh, let's let's see what others are saying. So uh, a technical analyst, uh, Hap Snedden, he was on uh, BNN Bloomberg as well. He does kind of like technical analysis stuff, and he was there in the beginning of April. And uh, he basically said it's a good buy, and it's kind of in the uptrend in 2023. Um, it could return to 2022 highs. So it's pushing a new high. It's definitely the time to buy. But he did recommend this name at 333, and now it's down to 280. So even from technical analysis, you can see uh, it's a little bit of a challenge. And I think that's why there is a lot of kind of opportunity for value being added. Uh, through what I'm sharing, because um, technical analysis, you know, you could uh, see the trend, but trend could quickly reverse on you. And I think it's really important from a value perspective. And mo most of my investments are all value oriented to really showcase why uh, one could conclude this company is very valuable. So one of the biggest uh, shareholders for Atabasco Oil uh, is Eric Nadal in Nine Point Energy Fund. So he was uh, on BNN, I think, in March. Um, and he had mentioned that um, they do have high, high exposure to rising oil prices, uh, excellent prospects going forward. So we're going to be looking what he, exactly he means by that. Um, major tax, lo tax losses will cover any tax expenses going forward. Um, so, yeah, so those are essentially the tax pools. We're going to do a deeper dive in, in this space about uh, what those tax pools are. 30 years of proven reserves. Uh, so I think those are like one, two, one P reserves. Uh, I think there's something like, I don't know, 60 years of two P reserves. But then we're going to be looking at some slides uh, when it comes to uh, all the um, reserve kind of evaluation that was done by the company, but also with, with Sat Oil, the company that where uh, the Lismer asset was actually purchased from Sat Oil. So this is a huge, uh, major, super major. Uh, internationally and Statoil did a big investment in this asset, especially when it comes to proving the reserves. And so we're going to be seeing some of that as well. Uh, and uh, he mentioned that they're going to be, uh, this, they started uh, doing buybacks uh, in March and which they did. So that that's good. And expecting more than 100% upside on the stock price. So that's kind of what he was sharing uh, back in March. And then, um, Another view, so this, this is basically like a 50-50. Some people like it, some don't like it. Uh, there was a view by Ross Healy uh, in the beginning of March. He he said, hey, just don't buy this name. Um, earning forecast of sleeping may come under pressure, not his favorite, too expensive, uh, see topics, right? So, but I think it's a little bit kind of uh, maybe naive, slightly lazy just to say, uh, maybe don't buy something I don't hold and it just kind of, uh, it's too expensive. How, why is it too expensive? So I think one of the goals maybe for this space and as I present kind of what, what this company been up to is maybe for the listener to decide for themselves if um, this, this company is too expensive. So, and, and this is again, uh, more for educational purposes, just sharing slides, um, a very consolidated review of the company, really knowledge share, not financial advice by any means. You know, you guys do whatever you want with this knowledge, but I feel like sometimes, uh, you know, it's almost like not fair where you go on TV and somebody just kind of randomly says, I like this, I don't like that, but what about kind of in-depth review of something and what about really understanding the name based on reality and based on what's happening. 
So another interesting element here uh, that back in February when the name was doing uh, the name it did quite better than what it does today. Um, uh, I think Eric was back on BNN. He shared that um, will return 75% of free cash flow starting April, which is uh, which is in line with the company communicated a tax loss in his estimates worth 0.44 for sure. Uh, there's about three billion dollars of tax pools, and we, we're going to be looking at what exactly, you know, what exactly it's worth. Uh, but in the in this estimate, 0.44 uh, uh, cents, I guess, 44 cents um, is fairly significant for a name that is not kind of uh, that big. And five for multiple would suggest a six dollar share price, right? So today it trades at 280. So this is just kind of a quick overview. Uh, of uh, what others were saying. And so I think right now what I want to do is um, just quickly summarize what I've done so far. I just showed you basically how this company, how it behaved uh, relatively to others when it comes to performance, uh, what uh, others are saying, kind of subject matter experts about this company um, in Bloomberg. So I would say it's 50-50. You don't really have people that you know uh, really like it and you have some people that like it a lot. And uh, so right now I'm going to share a little bit more information about the company. Uh, you know, going to go over the, the the slides for for their public kind of disclosure. We're going to review Q1, and, and then we're going to look at the regulator um, PowerPoint presentations. Do a little bit more of a technical kind of understanding of the asset, and uh, and kind of go from there. All right, so, and if you guys can see, obviously on Twitter spaces, you can see what, you know, you can only hear my voice, but I'm showing stuff live on, on Twitter live and on YouTube. Um, just kind of more, more of a attempt to add value to the community. You know, I've been doing spaces for, I think about a year and a half now on Fridays, uh, but I, I find that, you know, um, when I do maybe video sentiment, it's easier kind of for me. And then this way I have Fridays with my family and kids. Um, and uh, it's not like a five hour space where we debate uh, about uh, the macro, but more it's a little bit more kind of um, uh, value investing oriented, which is what I do. Uh, but my angle here is really provide kind of education and, and showcase uh, what those companies are, because sometimes it's very easy to to have a view and uh, on Twitter to say, well, this name is horrible or this name is amazing, but in, in, in overall, none of the parties really know knows what the company is doing in, in much detail, right? So, uh, but but this is kind of my attempt to to add value. So, okay, so let's take a look at um, uh, their corporate presentation. So right now, I'm sharing the May 2023 corporate presentation for Atabasca Oil Corp. All right, so let's let's make it a little bit bigger here. All right. Okay, so the company right now, if you look at the corporate snapshot, and I think it's really important because some numbers here will will be really key as we look at the financial standing and really trying to understand the their asset kind of um, you know asset production, what they produce, where they produce it from. What kind of oil is being, you know, generated, and what kind of what the netbacks look like, and what the overall strategy for the company going forward? All right, so this company, um, about I would say over ninety percent of this company is really uh, bitumen, so it's heavy oil. It's it's the heaviest oil uh, probably on planet Earth. Uh, the density for that oil is actually uh, close to the density of water. Now, if you mix um, any oil with water, 99% of the time that oil will float in water because the density uh, is uh, is lighter than that, that of water. Uh, sometimes it's not very intuitive when you actually see it, but if the separation is very clear and that separation of densities. Now, uh, in the equation for API, which is the indicator of how heavy the oil is, you have a specific gravity that... Uh, a specific gravity component, which is basically density um, difference in relation to the density of water. And so this, this some of those oils will be the heavier oils. And those oils will be kind of used uh, in various heavy applications. So uh, th those could be particles that you'll find in maybe 
diesel, so distillate, uh, jet fuels, um, asphalts, like some roads, right? Rubbers, uh, rubber, uh, shingles, stuff like that, right? So really heavy applications where today one could say um, there is no really a, a, a different competitor, competitor to, to this type of use because uh, for you to use something instead of shingles, let's say in certain regions of the world, uh, what other solutions can you have? You, you could, I guess, use solar panels to protect your roof, but uh, if uh, if you get snowed, then the solar panel is not going to be very useful. If you want um, maybe tires, those will have to be out of rubber. So what are you going to use, like wood or, or maybe other components? So I guess um, you guys can get the point where the, the heavier particles are becoming increasingly important. And in, in our Twitter community, we've been seeing that a lot of the production in the US is becoming increasingly lighter. And so this company really specializing in heavy oil production. So their API could be um, as low as eight and, or nine. And, um, um, and yeah, so th the heavy stuff, right? And so they have basically 35,000 per day oil production. 93% uh, of it is liquid. Um, and so 7% will be uh, basically gas, right? So you, you have a little bit of a gas component here um, and 5% annual base decline. But we, we're going to see that uh, the decline is not really kind of a realized decline in the asset where production is basically maintained flat. Um, it, what's unique about the thermal oil applications is that they use technology called SACDIS, steam assisted gravity drainage. And this technology is utilizing steam injection basically to reduce the viscosity of the oil that sits in the in the reservoir, like a hockey puck, and you can actually like drain it, drain it down, and that's why it takes years, years and decades to drain those massive reservoirs. Um, here they say predictable low decline projects, efficient brown brownfield safety development. So brownfield safety development is essentially uh, brownfield is when you just expand the asset. You you don't drill it, you don't build any new facilities for kind of creating new regions of oil. Uh, you just do more of the same with the same facilities and kind of expand your operations for the asset. And so what they're basically saying in brownfield expansion is that they don't really going to spend uh, or, or they're proud of the fact that there is no spend associated with greenfield development. Long reserve life resource, which is true. Uh, so they, they have significant one P2P. I think uh, in the uh, subject matter expert review that I've done about 10 minutes ago, uh, I think it was Eric that mentioned that they have like 30 years of reserves, but I think it's something like with two P's, like close to 100 years. They also have a, a lighter business unit. So they produce a very small portion of, of their overall oil production uh, with light oil. So you can see in the circle, for example, in the presentation that uh, 35,000 BOEs per day, so barrel of oil equivalent, um, about 30,000 barrels per day are BBL, so actual barrels produced. And the 5,000 BOEs per day are from light oil. And so they operate in Magni and Duvernay, um, in a stable production, flexible deployment. They actually have a JV partnership there, so joint venture partnership, and uh, de-risk resource and higher margins. So in, in the map that they show here in the presentation, they show the thermal oil production is basically several assets. So they show uh, Dover West and Corner, which is non-operating assets. So they, there is no oil production, but it's kind of part of their, uh, uh, I guess, their earth package or land package. But they do have two operating assets here in the map, which is Hangingstone and Lismer, where Lismer is kind of their, their jewel asset that was acquired uh, in 2015 from Stad Oil. And they have uh, uh, 275,000 gross acres uh, in Kebab and place it there, which is basically the Matni and Duvernay. Uh, regions and so that that's the smaller portion of the, of the portfolio. Now the basic count for uh, the shares they have 587 million shares. Market cap uh, when the stock price was three dollars ten cents was 1.8 million. Um, sorry, 1.8 uh, billion um, dollars. Yeah, the, that was the market cap. Today uh, the share price is about 280. So I think the the market cap or the enterprise value could be something like 1.7. And uh, net debt, so that's an interesting thing. And I think that's one of the reasons why 
they've done extremely well. They were very busy paying down debt in the last couple of years. So you guys uh, from uh, the Twitter community, you may recall that last year when oil prices were very high, there were a lot of arguments about kind of buying back shares or paying dividends. And there were essentially two camps uh, in the community where my take was always kind of like, hey, um, I don't know. I don't know about I don't know about that. I don't know if I want to really invest, let's say, in a company that um, pays dividends, but it's an oil and gas company. Like, why would you give me money back? Don't you have something better to do with this money? Because I think as a value investor, I would think, well, you just need to make more money with that money. If that company is not able to generate more money, why, like, you know, then you're going to give me the money back, you know, maybe it worked for some works for some investors or traders. But um, for me, I just couldn't like really understand why for me personally, that that could be a good move. And the buybacks, you know, I thought it, it could be an excellent idea. But in a world where uh, you, you had such significant challenges in, to ta- in 2020, uh, you, you had to deliver, you had to pay down the debt so, so you can actually trade uh, in line with, with other producers and not always kind of, you know, watching behind your back that you're not going to do it in the next cycle and you may not survive if, if you don't get the, if you get the networks, but you have your bills associated with basically maintaining that debt are, are too high. And especially in this current interest environment, you know, one could argue that this was the prudent thing to do. And so this company actually have done an amazing job uh, executing on the strategy. And so right now I would say, uh, based on the price, uh, it's 280, let's say, so it's 1.7 billion um, EV, or, EV, so enterprise value, with 57 million only being in debt. So net debt is 57. What's unique about their situation here is that I think they have something like uh, 170 million in cash, which, you know, with the strategy now of kind of trying to return value to shareholders and buying back shares now, uh this money could be utilized for that purpose but also it could be utilized to pay off the debt and and kind of uh you know um have only like on the books the actual 57 where uh because i think the the, the actual death is just two, over like 220 million or something like that and we can look a little bit further what exactly it is but when you have a giant cash position you you're kind of in a good shape so uh, for 2023 guidance, they, they're projecting 34.5 thousand uh, to 36 thousand BOEs per day, with capital expense program, capital expenditure program 145 million. And so that really gives you kind of the clue. Okay, so you're worth 1.7, 1.8 billion, and you're spending 145 million for capital expenditure program, and the share buyback estimate they say it's about 150 million. So let's say stock price is three divided by three, that's about 50 million shares, but you have 587. So that's about, I would say close to, what is it? Eight, 9% of the float. So that, that's kind of the, the strategy, I guess. So here, um, and, and here we can start comparing to how the, this information compares to what the subject matter experts were saying on being in Bloomberg and, and other TV channels. So the, the company is really saying here that um, they, they have top tier long life asset, 1.3 billion um, uh, BOEs in 2P reserves, right? And so if you start dividing this 1.3 billion BOEs in 2P reserves, that and, and if you produce at the current production rate, that's like, I don't know, 70, 80, 100 years, whatever it is, right? Uh, low sustaining capital is the shared before. Um, uh, ultra low leverage, strong liquidity, so 261 million liquidity and including 170 million, 173 million in cash. So for me, that cash is a very powerful uh, situation because if you, if your enterprise value is 1.7 billion and you have a net debt, 50 million, but you have 173 million in cash, that puts you in a very interesting position here, right? So, so that's something kind of to keep an eye on how that cash is being utilized. But in a way, I'm happy that it's just there because how, how are they going to use it to buy back shares if the stock declines, let's say, or maybe paying down debt? So the, the way they communicate here going forward, managing for shareholder returns, uh, they return 75% of excess free cash flow to shareholders. So that's kind of the commitment. Uh, competitive cost structure with tax-free horizon and prepaid crown royalties and thermal oil. 
And so this is really important to, to share. So when, when you make, let's say, an investment, and again, this is for, guys, this is for educational purposes only. This is just, I'm not a financial advisor, but this is something that, you know, I was thinking a lot about. So let's say you have the cash, but you have a cost structure for your asset where you have such significant tax pools of $3 billion where you're basically essentially not paying taxes on, on your assets, right? And so in the royalties, you, you basically in the prepaid crown royalties in thermal oil, yeah, which is your core asset, which is the, the 30,000 barrels per day that you produce. Um, and so, so no taxes, no royalties, a lot of cash, right? So it's a, it's a very kind of interesting, unique situation. Now this states something here that I'm not sure if it's reasonable, like, but th that's what they said in May, 1 billion uh, in free cash flow between 2023, 2024, 2025. So can they generate this? And if the oil prices, you know, based on their expectation work out in, in this fashion, um, for a company that's EV $1.7 billion generating free cash flow, $1 billion in free cash flow could be very significant, especially when when you committed to 75% of excess free cash flow return to shareholders. Okay, so I'll just gonna keep moving here because I have a lot of material to share. It's been already half hour, but um, I, I don't know, maybe I'll be here for a couple of hours. So let's go from there. Okay, so as mentioned before, uh, close to 35,000 barrels a day production, uh, 57 million operating income, um, 26 million in CapEx. So I think that's like a quarterly uh, quarterly numbers they give, 57 million net debt. Uh, so, so, that's, uh, so, so that was shared before, operating net back. Uh, $30 per BOE on light oil and 15 barrels in thermal oil. So one could easily, you know, um, calculate 35,000 barrels per day times 90 days times 15 and kind of really understand on the net back side what, what they're going to be getting. So this slide I find really interesting because uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, they were able to, uh, they had a very similar slide here last year and they're talking about Canadian heavy differentials. Uh, so what they're basically saying is that in 2024, they expect the differentials to be, um, between I think 10 to $15 right now is about $11. So that's, uh, that's an excellent price for, uh, WCS, the transient headwinds in the rear view. Uh, so U S heavy weighted strategic petroleum reserve releases. So U S, um, released the strategic petroleum, petroleum reserve SPR. Uh, about the drain it by about half now. So I think the balance right now should be, uh, I'm not sure, I think it's about 372 million barrels. Um, and I think uh, at the peak it was about 740. Uh, so so yeah, about 50% of it was drained. Now, a lot of it was heavy, heavy oil that was drained, right? Because there were some issues with diesel uh, prices last year, and I think President Biden at this point was begging companies not to buy back shares, but produce oil. I know we already kind of forgot about that, but that was reality last year. And so a lot of the heavy oil was was drained in a way. And so uh, they're basically saying here that um, U.S. heavy weighted SPR releases really support the differentials to stay uh, narrow. DC Energy Keystone Pipeline leak was an, was kind of an issue but uh, getting resolved, Russian sanctions impacting global oil trade flows. Um, that, that's up to debate, right? Uh, be, uh, as the Russian production is continuing to be steady, but we, we did see since uh, this presentation uh, a, a stand by uh, Saudis here on, on the July cut. So that's going to be interesting how that's going to unfold. Uh, and the elevated US refinery downtime. Now, th those all things were kind of the headwinds. Uh, now it's kind of tailwinds uh, expected. So improving demand uh, as China emerges from COVID restrictions. That, so that was back in May. Uh, I know there was a lot of kind of micromanagement of uh, the Chinese situation and how China reopens, uh, whether they reopen too fast or too slow. So there was some speculation. But you know, if you take a longer term view, China will reopen in some point. And uh, hard to say when fully openly on economic growth, but we know they will be through some cycle. Um, you know, functioning at their, at their peak production. And I think historically the oil demand uh, increases 1 million barrels per day 
uh, on an annual basis, right? So if uh, if I think this year the demand is expected to be under two million barrels, then uh, if we look pre-COVID, uh, every year uh, the the product the demand uh, on the increased by about million barrels per day on an annual basis. A new global heavy refining capacity in Mexico, so that's the 340,000 barrels per day refining capacity in Mexico. So that, that kind of alludes to the side where Mexico could produce their oil refined, basically be, I guess, independent of US, which will require, I guess, extra input of Canadian heavy to, to the Gulf. Uh, Transmodern expansion, so TMX, um, uh, that, that's a big one, right? 590,000 barrels per day early 2024 that the expected timeline as the route to the west coast kind of opens up uh, wcs is expected to uh, differentials for that associated with wcs expected to narrow and lower industry supply growth with focus on return of capital and again this cannot be um, uh, understated i guess uh, yes yeah, sure we do see elevated oil production through optimization and brownfield development and such and and um, you know, as companies trying to basically capture the netbacks, but the greenfield development is very limited. Uh, you don't really see big capex projects. You know, we, we did see one uh, announced by International Petroleum Corp on um, on basically the Black Rod pilot that they're going to expand. So this is a true greenfield development where they're building facilities like to develop new oil, the capacity, all that. But you don't see much of that anymore. And I think that was kind of their angle here. Um, on the cash flow torque, uh, and their assumption in their presentation is that uh, $5 WCS div makes an $80 million uh, annually impact on, on the cash flows, right? So I think it's really important because a lot of their assumptions is 15, today is 11, so we always have to add this extra 80 million uh, annually for what they're proposing here for the cash flows. And a differentiated long life reserves like th this asset in Lismer um, and Hanging Stone is 1.2 billion barrel to be heavy oil reserves. And so take a calculator, uh, 1.2 billion, right? Divide by the current production and then come come up with the days, how many days it's going to be or years or decades it's going to take to produce at current production rates, especially as you don't produce greenfield development. And so. Uh, you can you could come up with 90 uh, years, uh, 100 years, and so that's one of the challenges. Is like, um, you know, in in a world where we look on daily, weekly, sometimes quarterly basis, what does a five, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 year investment looks like, right? So it's very difficult to comprehend, but that's kind of the price of some of those assets. Okay, so this is an important slide from their presentation on the business outlook. So you can see the production is expected to grow, but very slightly. So they expect basically in 2023 to be at 35,000 barrels per day, which is kind of where they're at. In 2024, the production to increase to roughly 38, 39,000 barrels per day, and then just over 40,000 barrels per day in 2025, as, um, as basically they continue the brownfield expansions, especially in Lismer. Uh, so here they say business outlook, a low risk sustainable capital projects, thermal oil underpins growth and low decline, light oil provides natural internal cost of hedge. And in our community, we did have those conversations in the past about uh, kind of hedging the heavies with the light ends. Now, competitive cost structure, tax-free horizon, $3 billion of tax pools. So last year, we did a lot of due diligence on what does $3 billion of tax pools for a one7 billion EV uh, enterprise value company is. What, what, what's the meaning of that number? Um, in my review initially, when I started the space, I think Eric Nadal alluded to 0.44 per share. Uh, and you have about 587 million shares. So let's say half of that, uh, and, you know, 0.5, let's say 0.5 dollars uh, in tax pools could be deductible. So that will be about uh, $250 million, right? So maybe $260 million. Now let's be a little bit more conservative and just give it a value of 250 as you basically don't pay taxes uh, in a way and uh, you kind of tapping into those pools. So that's, that's something to, to make a note of and I'm making it right here that there is this, if you, if you kind of value this company, 
what's the value of those tax pools? Well, that number is roughly $250 million. So prepayout current royalties and thermal oil. So the way thermal oil royalty structure works is that you pay uh, very little royalties um, to the crown if you prepay out. This is to incentivize investment in the sector. Once you basically uh, paid off your greenfield development cost and essentially the capex cost, you go to post payout status. And so those royalties could be as high as, I don't know, 33%, 30%. But prepay out, you, you have a different structure and I will share some of this a little bit more detail. And so one could kind of see, hey, uh, by 2027, Lismer will not pay royalties. And I think by 2028, under current production rates, uh, Hangingstone will not pay royalties. So again, very interesting value proposition. Whenever you make any investment, whether you buy Walmart or you buy, um, I don't know, uh, any other company, right? Uh, th those companies will pay taxes. Th there'll be some kind of maybe on the... Um, on the commodity aspect, there will be a royalty structure where it comes back to the states, it comes back to the provinces. M money has to be paid because the owners of those assets are the citizens of the states and those provinces. But in this case, uh, because they prepay out status, they pay very little royalties and essentially no taxes because of the tax pool. So very interesting angle with this company. Okay, so they have a robust free cash flow profile here. Uh, annual sustaining capital, $125 million. Uh, modest growth capital of 20 million, 2023. And strong cash profile. They again, they proposing here that they will be generating free cash flow of $1 billion between 23, 24, 25. Now, what's really interesting about the slide is that <clears throat> you can see the adjusted funds flow in million, right? And so this is the one thing that if there was value like from this space, from this YouTube, Twitter live that one could get, th this will be the metric that one have to address. Very often on Twitter, people will say, well, this company is, is really bad. They're not, you know, they'll, they'll use names, they call it a shit core or something, you know, but look at this graph, right? And this really alludes to the cost structure of what you spend, what you adjust in funds flow at, at every price, uh, 70 WTI, 80 WTI, 90 WTI, and 100 WTI. And um, basically what your spend is, and we know it's about $145 million on the CAPEX side. And basically, where is your break even here, right? So you can see that for 70 WTI, and I think their assumption here in small letters is uh, WCS diff is $15. So essentially they're suggesting 55 WCS uh, on the adjusted funds flow in 2023, they generate about $200 million, right? And so if you take, um, and I think um, with 80 WTI and 15, which is where WCS is about $65 WCS, they generate, I think close to 300. It's, it's very difficult to say here based on, um, Kind of the scale but it's kind of in the middle i would say so so one could just see you know for your, yourself but at hundred dollar uh, wti with 15 dollar uh, differential uh, you kind of get into that 500 million dollars right so where your overall capex sustaining capex is i don't know it's like 145 something like that so you get in free cash so you get what uh at $100 uh, WTI, get like 350 or something like that. So $350 million in free cash flow out of $1.7 billion, that, that becoming very substantial. That's like over 20% free cash flow yield, right? At the same time, we can't be talking about $100 WTI because we're not there, right? We're not there yet. We could be there. But, and, and then again, uh, for 2024, if you're at $100 WTI, to show the scale again, where you could be at, um, I don't know, over $700 million in, in uh, basically adjusted funds flow. And if you remove the spend, then maybe like, I don't know, free cash flow could be, I don't know, over 500 million, right? Which, which becomes really funny. And I think that's where Eric sometimes says, um, this companies can pay off for itself in like two, three, four years, right? And that's a kind of, what it comes down to because 
you have your capital expenditure program. On the adjusted funds flow, you take adjusted funds flow, you remove that, you get your free cash flow. If you committed to buying back shares entirely, you potentially could buy back your all of your shares at $100 oil uh, in three years. So some people are kind of critical of that in the community, um, you know. But but then the core assumption becomes, hey, I need to see that $100 WTI. And again, by now we know it's not really guaranteed. You it's just you know something that you can't just wish and it will happen. But um, under that scenario, this company is able to do that. Th this is just a fact because um, if you have those prices and you have your capex structure and, and predictable production with low, very low decline, as we will see very soon, this is just kind of where you're at. And then what the show here is that every $5 move in WTI, it's $50 million to the adjusted fast flow structure and WCS differential at minus $5. Uh, adds $80 million. So for example, let's let's use a case here where we'll look at $70 WTI, which is where we are, I think now, exactly at 70 WTI. So adjusted funds flow are very close to $200 million, right? But WCS assumption differential is 15, but we're closer to 10, we're about 11. So you can add another $70 million, let's say. If you look at the CapEx structure, you're at 145. So you had 55, a million dollars plus let's say uh, you add about 70 million for the WCS differential so you get 120 so your enterprise value is 1.7 you yielding free cash flow 120 well that's over 10 percent free cash flow yield right so so this is uh this is something that I don't think it's common knowledge I don't think it's understood I think there's a lot of views for people just to say oh, this is just a small whatever, nobody cares about this company. But I think if it's really important to dive into the numbers, understand those sensitivities, and really understand what is the free cash flow kind of being generated here. But I'm not even a free cash flow guy. I, that's not what, you know, why I do this. I, I'm more of a kind of value guy. And here I'm, I'll show on the educational side more of the value of this company. And again, they do a pretty good job kind of saying, so we have adjusted funds flow here. We have sustaining capex, excess cash flow, growth capital, which is very limited, and that's again one could could be a good case for the bulls, where growth capital is is very very small, and then a normal course issuer bid, uh, NI um, NCIB is basically seventy five percent, right? So that's kind of uh, what what they committed to, I guess. So in this picture, you can see their their facilities. So we, we're going to be talking a little bit more about those facilities and what the potential cost for some of those facilities is and just kind of go from there. OK, so let, let's talk a little bit about the thermal oil division. They have 100% working interest. This is not a GV. Uh, they produce 30,000 barrels per day uh, on those two assets. And they have $120 million capital expenditure program, just as I shared. Um, Look, look at those numbers, gross reserves proved, proved in 2P, 403 million barrels, uh, 1.2 billion barrels. So that's around 40 years uh, of reserve live index and over 100 years proved in 2P. So that's kind of what I was alluding to, right? Um, I think on the BNN Bloomberg, somebody mentioned 30 years, but sure. And I think that's kind of one of those challenges is like, how do you value a company that you know has 40 50 60 100 years of reserves and very soon in some slides we will see that start oil did a lot of uh basically uh vertical drilling and the assets to is in lismer to take a look at what kind of the asset looks like and where the geology is and where the oil is right so all of that work been done so which is kind of exciting so that's why they're able to have a lot of um confidence in sharing the data. And I'm sure you will conclude that too when I show it to you, uh, the amount of work that was done. So I really like this slide and because it talks about oil sense royalty rates and which companies are, which peers are in royalty payout status. And you can see many, many companies that are in post status. So they pay a lot of royalties. I think it's about 33%. And you have the pre status, which uh, much lower uh, royalty rates. Now, one could say, well, you have the Borges uh, royalty status, which is the private hands. I think something there, um, yeah, something, uh, th that royalty 
program, and I know we've had a lot of discussion last year about this. I think it's it's just under nine percent, but it also has a sliding sliding uh, scale. So I think at sixty WTI there is like barely any royalties being paid, but those royalties are increasing slightly uh, as the oil price is increasing, right? So I think at the peak it was like nine or ten percent, but then again it's not thirty percent, right? It's not uh, you, you don't pay like those royalties to the government at thirty three percent. Uh, until um, 2027 for Lismer and 2028 for Hengistone. And so here we can look at actually how the royalties are being paid. So you can see the pre-payout status and post-payout status. So today with 70 WTI, and you can see that if you are pre-payout status on the blue line, you're paying just 3% in, in, uh, in royalties. You're paying 3% to the province. But if you post status, you pay about 27%. Huge difference. You pay about 27% if your asset is post, post payout. Look at the big difference uh, if we go to, let's say, $100 oil. So at $100 oil, um, you pay just, I think, if if I was to guess exactly where it is, if you pre royalty payout status, you pay between 5 to 10%, and I would say it's about 7, maybe 7.5%. 7 if you're post payout status, you're paying 33%. So the, the argument last year was kind of like you pay paying royalties to private hands at $100 oil, uh, 9%. Uh, sure, yeah, but you don't pay 33%. Like, so for, for me, in a way, it was a no-brainer. And so as we speak about kind of why the company outperformed, I think there are several angles here. The first one, I think the debt payment. So while everybody were arguing uh, about buying back shares or or paying dividends, they were busy paying down debt. Secondly, uh, tax pools, they didn't pay taxes, right? Because they have those significant amount of tax pools, $3 billion of tax pools. And then on the royalty, uh, today in 2023, they're, they're not gonna pay those increased royalties until 2027 and Lismer. And so in the current realities, they're paying maybe three, three, three and a half percent, right? Where everybody in post paying uh, close to 27%. So let's see what some of those assets that are in post us. Just some examples. So Foster Creek for Synovus is there. Uh, CNQ Primrose is there. Uh, Suncor, essentially uh, Syncrud mine is there for post payout. Uh, CNQ Jackfish is there. Mackay River for Suncor is post. Christina Lake, huge, huge, amazing uh, asset, but they're in post status. Uh, Tucker for Synovus, Fireback for Suncor. So huge names. Huge names. In pre-payout status, you have Curl for Imperial as an example. Christina Lake for Meg. I think they're transitioning from pre to, to post. Uh, they may be transitioning from pre to post even in this quarter. Don't take my word for it because I'm not sure how their netback is going to be looking like in this type of environment, what, what their actual revenue is looking like because we did see a reduction in oil prices. But I think they were kind of due less quarter but seems like maybe the, this is the quarter where they transition. Um, and some other examples, CNQ, Jack Pine, Jack, Jack Pine Mine, Jackfish, uh, Horizon, um, Horizon Mine, uh, Synovus, Sunrise Field is in post, in sorry, prepayout, and Sanko Fort Hill. So, and again, you can see here where they're going to be graduating to the post status. For example, Christina Lake, Megan projected uh, $85 WTI in 2023. I think it's like an older slide from uh, government of Alberta, the Scotia Bank G G B M estimates or G A T M. I'm not sure exactly what this is, but you, you kind of get the idea that there's a post and pre status, right? And so what they're basically saying here is that royalty is very depending on whether a project is in prepayout or post out pay status. Uh, Pre-payout royalties rates are lower to account for the initial cost of investment. Again, the idea here is not giving anybody break. All those guys that pay in post-payout status, they were pre-payout before that. So they kind of, you know, got their money back in a way for making an investment, which is a greenfield investment. And now they basically post, uh, post status. So they kind of graduated and now they're going to pay uh, gross revenue less OPEX and, and CAPEX. Uh, royalties at, at higher rates. And so 
and I think it's kind of very exciting for this company. You know, like how many companies can say, "Hey, I'm I, I have huge taxables and pay taxes, but they're also on the structure paying like three percent right now in royalties, which is great." So Lismer has 1.4 billion of unrecovered balance. At 85 WTI, post payout is reached at 2027, but we're not at 85 dollars WTI. We're like at 70, and so that that value is kind of going to get a little postponed to maybe 2028. Hengistone has 900 million dollars of unrecovered balance, and it uses 85 WTI post payout to reach uh, you know 2030 plus. Now here is a key thing that I don't think it's common knowledge. So. Lismer is the asset that was acquired from Statoil in 2015. The unrecovered balance for the uh, for the capex for the royalty payment is 1.4 billion. So think about this: they already got to 1.4 billion, and they have more to go, right? To 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 get it to zero, and then they get to post uh, status. But that number cannot be ignored. This is 1.4 billion dollars. And the entire enterprise value is $1.7 billion. So there is something that here that is like, hey, the initial investment for the asset was way more than the current enterprise value of this asset, right? So, so and because hanging stone, you, you have 900 million in current status. They also got to this point. So what was this number originally? 1.3 billion, 1.5, what was it? Um, Lismer, 1.4 billion, what was it before? 2 billion? So you start adding this, you're like, hey, this is an asset that trades in 1.7 billion enterprise value, but the initial capital investment to develop that asset was maybe a double from that. So I'm not sure exactly what Stato will spend on Lismer, but this is something to keep in mind. Okay, so here we're gonna go to kind of my favorite part um, and talk a little bit more about Lismer, uh, the asset from a technical perspective, exactly what the asset looks like and what they're gonna be doing. Uh, in the asset, what they project to be doing. They have a little statement here about reserves um, and uh, like a small disclosure about uh, non-GAAP financial information for more, you know, but basically guys, this is just for educational purposes. Uh, I'm not sure if like if anybody did such in-depth review of this company to really understand it better, but I hope you guys getting a lot of value from it. So, uh, all right. so. This is the map here of this asset, Lismer. Okay, so we're looking at Lismer. We're going to be seeing a little bit more slides when it comes to kind of this asset and what it does. So the initial, the core asset here on the north east side of this map was developed by Statoil. It was drilled by Statoil. This well's been operating, I don't know, since maybe 2011. Um, and then uh, Atabasca bought this asset for, I think, close to $500 million from Statoil in a time where oil prices were extremely low. I think Statoil went out and Atabasca took advantage of kind of European country uh, companies leaving Canada to, to step in. But in a way, they took on a significant amount of debt, debt. And that a lot of the debt was paid off through that cycle that we just experienced in the past two years. So I think it's like really important to connect the dots here. It's like, hey, you bought something for cheap. Uh, you got yourself in debt trouble. Okay, prices were low. In a time where elevated prices were kind of in place, you took that net backs, and instead of buying back shares, instead of paying dividends, you paid that debt. Like for me, you know, th this is the responsible way to conduct business, right? And then you're basically saying that you could be generating, um, you know, right now in this current environment, maybe free cash flow yield may be just around 10%, but... Um, you, you could be making here, on, at least today, I don't know, something like $120 million uh, annually in free cash flow. But one thing I will stress, and that's the one thing that I think on Twitter is a little bit tricky. There was this pushback uh, against the CEO getting paid million dollars or $2 million more than like an average CEO um, in uh, in basically in, in in the category that was described by that person. So, and I don't really exactly remember the exact number, whether it was like four million or five million, or and, and I think it's it's really important to kind of think about this a little bit in the context. It's like okay, well, you are really upset 
about a guy getting paid a million dollars more than average between some group. And you kind of call it greed or whatever. But within the context of the free cash flow and the torque this company gives and the rebalance of the of the portfolio and, and the way they execute it on, on asset development, as you can see here in this picture, why would I get upset about that some guy gets paid a million dollar extra? Like if I want to be an adult, like a, a professional investor in the sector, what, why would I be so emotional about a guy getting even $3 million more? Like if you're able to de-risk so much, generate such good returns on relative basis, outperform your peers because you, you, you were laser focused on paying down debt and basically positioning yourself in a situation where you have cash when you have free cash flow even at current prices where you're not in a position to pay royalties at elevated rates anytime soon where you have significant tax pools why the investment thesis has to be about this guy getting paid slightly more so i think i wanted to put this kind this thing in context now look at the life reserve 85 year uh, rli uh, 698 million barrels to peer reserves, uh, 395 million barrels, uh, best estimate indigenous resource, uh, excellent reservoir. They think they can be under three for long-term steam to our ratio. Um, and th this is kind of the, I think the exciting part about this company that I don't think it's common knowledge. What they've done really well is in 2023, uh, they started producing oil from the SPED LT in the north corner there. Um, they first drilled uh, four whelpers, I think, and they just added another five adjacent to it. Now, the production from those wells, I think the previous production, as you can see in the graph below, in 2022, uh, was just kind of under 20,000 barrels per day. I think it was like around 18. And then towards January 2023, they were able to produce, I think, like 21,000 barrels per day. And, and now you have kind of projected towards January 2024 to get maybe to 24,000 barrels per day. Well, that production is going to come from those wells, as well as adjacent four wells, that uh, five wells that have been drilled on the pad. Now, the risk associated with that production is very low because the land at exactly the same geology as the other four well pairs that you that you already drilled in that zone. Now, the difference between this type of production versus conventional is that this is almost like a tuxedo cake in Costco where you buy and you see the layers. So this layer is just there. You, you core it, you pull the core out, you, you look at the core and you can see the pay. It's, it's very heavy oil. It, it's like it's like asphalt. It's you can see that layer. As long as you land those wells um, through MWD measuring well drilling, producer at the bottom, injector five meters away, you could estimate the production based on the geology, based on the permeability, based on the porosity within that layer, because you have good understanding of the pay um, at that section. And so they went north, drilled L8. Uh, got their production to, I think, 20,000 barrels per day on Lismer. And line of sight now, I think close to 1,000 barrels per day on four well pairs, maybe 1,200 by year end. But then another plan here is basically continuing developing this asset, going safely into the zone in the red box here that we, we can see on the map. Now, again, if you on Twitter spaces, I'm showing on YouTube Live, handle razor oil and also on twitter live you can see me on twitter live if you go on my um uh, profile on twitter you can see me talking which is kind of weird but whatever and so they're going into this red box and drilling next to adjacent wells have been producing for for forever and that's actually a fairly smart move because uh there was a lot of thermal conductivity being conducted to that oil so a lot of that oil could be mobile already because the steam chamber been developing for some time now and kind of the re residual heat been transferring to, to the other sections, right? Because it's never ideal when you inject steam, the heat transfer could be to the oil that you're targeting, but you do have like kind of heating from the sides and 
and from kind of the the toe and the heel of the of the wells. And if you're not sure what the toe and the heel are, you look at your foot. You have a toe. You have a heel. So the heel is basically where you come down from a vertical section all the way to horizontal. A toe is just the toe. It's kind of the back of the well. Okay, so pad L8 expansion, new five well pad, commence steam in Q1, ramp up to 6,000 barrels per day plateau by year end. So this is an interesting dynamic. They're projecting 6,000 barrels per day. I actually don't know. I, I'm, I'm like being a little bit more conservative. If they get 6,000 barrels per day on the peak production on the, on the thermal here, that if, and if they don't have a decline right now from the current production rate, which is 20,000 barrels per day, Lismer will be at 26,000 barrels per day. So, so that's kind of interesting, but you know, I'm thinking maybe 24. Drilling to commence in June of an expansion project. So in drill 12 additional sustaining infill wells, oil facility upgrade. So what, what this essentially means is that between the, the thermal uh, well pairs, so you have injector producer, um, as you develop those chambers, you have the space in between where the heat transfer was kind of transferred, the heat was transferred, but there is no well in between the wellpers to collect the oil. And that's what they're alluding to here in infill. So they really want to be opportunistic. They want to say, okay, well, we developed a lot of uh, well per production. We don't necessarily want to like develop a new pad, but from the same infrastructure, we're going to put just one well between those well pairs and basically get the oil that's been drained there. So I think it's a really smart approach on their behalf. So if you at Tabasco and you're listening, uh, I think it's a great approach. Me personally, that's my personal kind of observation. And sustainable growth, uh, 24,000 barrels per day, 2023 exit, and 28,000 barrels per day per mid-2024. Okay, so this is interesting because uh, I have like some more things to kind of in support of that, but please remember that production, 28,000 barrels per day, mid-2024, uh, that could be achieved through the bottlenecking. Like, so you basically go to um, the process facilities and you improve your inflow. You can, you can also achieve that probably by reducing the SOR, which they do through um, uh, basically co-injection. So NCG and antennas by gas co-injection, uh, where you don't have to inject as much steam and you can produce um, a little bit more oil because you, you have lower water cut now. But they also communicate future options, regulatory approval in place for expansion for 40,000 barrels per day, uh, critical path, long lead items inventory. So they have that. Uh, and future expansion depend on oil, oil price. So I think it's really smart. Like they, they have this huge flexibility, low decline, able to basically expand on demand of the oil prices. So, so they're not sweating, right? So essentially towards 2027, Lismer is supposed to be at 40,000 barrels per day. Uh, for the expansion potential, but if not, they're just going to remain at that 28, I guess, 24, 28. And here they also share that any expansion project in the field is about 47, uh, 14,000 barrels per day uh, per flowing, essentially. So, so $14,000 uh, per barrel, right? 14,000, where a development cost for a greenfield asset could be something like 30,000 per flowing. And we've seen the recent acquisitions for 60,000 per flying. So here they're essentially saying, hey, uh, if I was to do a greenfield development, I will pay double. But if I was to get acquired, uh, I basically like, it's like, you know, 80% discount to the acquisition value. So I think it's it's pretty smart move on their behalf. I really like the economic slide here as well. They basically talk about uh, welfare type, barrels per day payouts. So 10 times better than in five years that I find it uh, really funny, but yeah. So if you hold this, th this thing's supposed to pay out for itself like 10 times uh, through the power of compounding. Um, so low crown royalties, uh, max 9% pre payout versus 40% post payout. So they again, very proud of their that angle. Uh, $1.4 billion royalty balance, pre payout 2027, 80, 80 fold. Five dollars WTI, um, and and then you can see here on the right basically how they uh, do um, their economics. So if they were to make an investment, what uh, what kind of stuff they're looking at? So for example, 
per capita, $48 million for L8, uh, for the PED. Um, EOR, so I think it's like ultimate recovery factor, uh, 15,000, what is this, 50 million barrels. IRR, so uh, internal rate of return, 170,000, uh, sorry, 170%. Uh, NPV 10, $380 million. So that, that's amazing, right? $380 million NPV 10, and that present value at 10% interest. Um, capital uh, recycle ratio, 14 times, capital efficiency is uh, 8,000, uh, uh, dollars like so 8,000 barrels per day so 8,000 per flying so that's your capital efficiency again a greenfield development 30,000 per flying acquisition value 60,000 per flying and a p and i eight times so here you can see that essentially on the welfare type and payouts 10 times payout in five years so re really interesting kind of schematic here okay so th this is a little bit of a controversial asset uh, but I think I have a lot of value to add here when it comes to this asset. By the way, guys, this is not financial advice by any means. This is just for educational purposes only, uh, sharing publicly available information. I consolidated a lot of this information and just kind of sharing it with, with our community, trying to add value. But uh, please, educational purposes only. If, if you ever want to invest, just talk to a financial advisor. I'm not a financial advisor. But um, yeah, that's kind of what the company is sharing. And, I'm hoping to share a little bit more kind of technical stuff about what they're up to. So again, Hanging Stone um, is one of those assets where I would talk to people and uh, they would say, oh, this is uh, such a horrible asset. This is a disaster, blah, blah, blah. Look at this chart here on the production side. So 2018, um, just if I'm looking at the bars, I think they reported about 8,200 barrels per day production in Q1 2023. So essentially, this is very similar production to what was done in 2018. So five years later, this company is producing the same amount of oil from this asset. But look at the steam to a ratio, which is the blue line. So steam to a ratio, and that's your indication of kind of the quality of the asset or your ability basically to, to you know, to have better economics. So you want the lower steam ratio, steam to a ratio possible. So the steam to a ratio was about five, I would say, in 2020. Uh, it was closer to six uh, in 2018. But now it's 3.5. So they were able to cut the steam to a ratio almost by half. And the reason why they were able to do this is that because they implemented a technology called NCG implementation. So non-condensable gas co-injection. And essentially, uh, this is a fairly heterogeneous asset. So they started injecting with steam a little bit of non-condensable gas, which is essentially methane. And this allows them to operate in the pressure, in the reservoir pressure, without injecting a lot of steam, but yet they were able to sustain production at 8,000 barrels per day, which is amazing. So 3.5 SOR, it's very, uh, comparable to other assets that are not maybe such great quality, but the starting point for that asset, at least in my conversations at, at our get togethers was always that this is basically um, this asset worth zero. That, that was the starting conversation. Where what I see here is 8,000 barrels per day, SR 3.5 with opportunities for a lot of infills. So, that's kind of my personal observation of what I see in this chart. So they're basically saying here, 60-year uh, to be RLI, 170 million barrels per day to be reserves, uh, sorry, billion uh, barrels in to be reserves. And so for 60 years, this company could produce that 8,000 barrels per day at SOR 3.5 or 4, and it's not worth zero. It's not, I'm sorry. And if there was another reason for me to say, why is this company um, did better than others as I started this presentation, I think this could be one of those reasons because there was a lot of optimization and a lot of improvement on the asset. And the starting point was like, this worth nothing. Well, if, if I offered you 8,000 barrels per day um, company right now, 
that somebody thinks it's worth zero, <clears throat> but it's not zero. It's it's doing quite well. It's generating positive free cash flow even at current prices. So where where is the disconnect? You know. So that, I think that was kind of the concern. Okay, so from the strategic positioning about hanging stone, <clears throat> they basically say here, maximize margin and near-term free cash flow, 120 million, uh, 2022 operating income at $38 per barrel, uh, operational readiness for future sustaining pads. So in my view, the core asset is Lismer, for sure. Hanging stone is kind of a legacy asset, it's there, it, it's doing what it's doing, they continue to optimize it, but it's not horrible. So yeah, so that's kind of where, where they're at on this. I will not talk much about the light oil, uh, but this is just something to consider from their presentation. It's about 5,500 barrels per day, uh, ending 2023. They're spending very little amount of money on uh, capital uh, expenditures here. So like very little, uh, I think it's like $25 million. Uh, there is a big position, and they do have JV with Murphy here on this asset. So this is something else to kind of consider uh, where kind of they, they could be going with, with, with that activity here on, on the light oil. Because definitely Lismer is kind of the, the, the jewel, right? So where Plus and Matney, you have 70% working interest. You, you actually operate this asset. On K. Bob Duvernay, it's 30% working interest and non-operated. But again, um, we did see some transactions associated with KBOB and uh, Martin. So maybe there's an opportunity here. The fact that the RNJV is it creates um, an, an interesting kind of angle here. But at the same time, this they're not really spending that much money on the asset anyway. So you can see here that 25 million net capital expenditure program divided by four, that's their quarterly spend. So that's that's minimal right so but at the same time you know 55 uh, 100 barrels per day BOEs per day so barrel of oil equivalent um no near-term land maturities capital expenditures governed through a joint development agreement so they're basically just continuing going and one could argue it could be a positive because they have this a flexible hedge i guess And you can see some of the light oil activities here uh, in the presentation, but uh, I prefer kind of to skip that. All right. So, so far, uh, we've been about an hour and 12 minutes into this. Uh, so far, I shared uh, the difference um, between this company and I think why it performed uh, with other companies. Uh, some of the reviews from subject matter experts about the name and uh, what they're thinking. And we were kind of like 50-50. Some people really like on BNN Bloomberg and they really like this company. Some really don't like it. We went over the corporate presentation. Um, yeah, so I think it's time to maybe look at some Q1 results and then review some AR applications. So I think I, I will be going for another like maybe an hour on this because there's just so much to share here. All right, but before I start, uh, something I wanted to to share also, and that something is uh, affiliated with the recent transaction here that was taking place in August uh, last year. Uh, this was, and here I'm sharing in the screen, and if you wanna see what I'm talking about, please, um, take a look at on YouTube Live and Twitter Live. So I'm going to share on my screen, I'm sharing right now. Um, you can see the, the deal that was done between uh, Strathcona Resources. Uh, so the, the reference here is Energy Now uh, from, from August last year. Strathcona Resources um, acquiring Serafina for $2.3 billion. And you can see here that they acquired, Serafina produces 40,000 barrels of oil equivalent BOEs. I think majority of the production from Saskatchewan was um, was heavy, so it was like SEGD production. 
And this value here, $2.3 billion, was Canadian. So if you take um, if, if you take basically this value, 2.3 billion, and again, I don't remember exactly what was the light oils, the BOEs for the light oils or the heavy barrels per day, but let's say 40,000 barrels on BOEs equivalent, $2.3 billion, you come up with close to 58,000 per fluent, 60,000 per fluent. Now, considering there was an angle of like some light oils, I think the heavy oil production was like maybe 36, 38,000 barrels per day you kind of come to the conclusion that that this transaction was based on maybe like 60,000 barrels uh, per flowing price. So 60,000, right? Now, where am I going with this? I think there's an interesting angle here to Lismer and what I showed so far from a value perspective. And the value here is like this. So they basically told us there are 20,000 barrels per day right now. They drilled the L8, other half of L8 pad, as we've seen, and we're gonna see a little bit more um, on the slides that I'm gonna be sharing. Uh, okay, uh, 24,000 barrels per day. The bottlenecking for next year, another 40,000 barrels per day opportunity to handle, probably in CG co-injection and infill syndication. So 28,000. What's the value of this asset if you produce, if you look at the recent transactions on the heavies, right? If we look at even at the Suncor kind of uh, offer that they've had recently with Total, um, it was close to 60,000 barrels per day as well. So through IPCO, International Petroleum Corp, they told us they want to produce 30,000 barrels per day heavy by 2028, investing close to a billion dollars. And 30,000 uh, barrels per day times 30,000 per flowing, that's roughly a billion dollars. So we know the acquisition value is 60,000 per flowing. The development value is 30,000 per flowing. The brownfield expansion is about 14,000 per flowing. And so if you position yourself in a situation where, and I'm doing the math right now on the calculator as I speak, uh, if you produce 28,000 barrels per day from heavy, and let's say you have 100 years of, of reserves that you could produce, but we're not going to give it any credit. We're just going to ignore the fact that there's 100 years of oil. You get $1.68 billion. So let's say $1.7 billion. Well, this is 28,000 barrels per day production on Lismer, and this is basically their current enterprise value. And so if I was to go back to why I think they outperform, just trying to reflect more from an educative point of view, just kind of how I think about this, is that I don't think there was much kind of, the market was very smart about this company. I think there was this understanding is like, hey, wait a second. There is a thermal transaction here for this value. There is a thermal transaction there for that value. There is a development cost associated 30,000 barrels per day with that value. The market was smart to recognize maybe that the value of the asset of the current enterprise value is the value of Lismer only maybe next year. And now as this presentation unfolded, we learned a couple of things. We learned there's 8,000 barrels per day hanging stone production. Uh, what is the value of that asset? Let's say, if you took that 60,000 barrels per day uh, matrix and just give it, let's say half of it, let's say 30,000 per flying. So eight times three is what, 24? So let's give it 240 million. So you gave it 240 million. Let's say there is um, the light oils. So they, the gave up stuff, the 5,500 barrels per day. Let's trade, let's say it's 20,000 per flying. Okay, so let's say 20,000 20, per flying. Not 30, not 40, not 60, because minimal kind of uh, facilities relatively to thermal, let's say 20,000 per flying. What is the value of that $100 million? So you start, like for next year, you start adding, okay, I get 1.7 billion. I get 200 million in tax pools. I get 200 million, let's say hanging stone, assuming 50% discount to current market value. I get another 100 million in conventional. You start adding, adding, adding. 
you end up with 2.2, 2.3 billion dollars. So from a value perspective, this this become becomes interesting because not and, and, and look at the quality of what I'm sharing now and the conversation that sometimes is taking place on Twitter because sometimes on Twitter somebody could say, well, this is just garbage. This is not a good company. But here we'll look in a deeper dive to those numbers. Now let's say the company doesn't sell, which it may or may not. I have no idea. Like everything I share here is in the public domain. It is it, the only difference is that I basically consolidated all this information and presented it to you. But let's say the transaction doesn't take place and we have the prices we have today with the cash flows we have today. So the free cash flow just under 10%, let's say 7, 8%. Okay, sounds good. So they're going to buy, I don't know, 50 million shares this year, 40 million shares. So they're 580 going to 40, 540. Let's say they continue on this path with the prices we have today, not, not getting too fancy. Another 40 million in shares, buyback, 75% free cash flow, just like we talked initially. So they had 500 million. And so I think the concept of time here becomes kind of like, hey, uh, you're just going to get cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. But from a value perspective, just by adding the current mar market transactions, as I discount you even further, you, you basically still cheap. And so I think maybe one of the reasons to why there was a performance was that there was like minimal expectation, especially from Anderson, because I, I remember talking to people that really involved in the sector and they're like, hey, I, I don't know. It's, it's kind of, I don't really understand Anderson. It's like, oh, it's that high SOR asset. Well, that high SOR asset is now 3.5 SOR asset, which is amazing using this technology. So, and the production is, the declines are minimal. And there is an opportunity for infill integration. There is an opportunity to drill uh you know sustaining kind of brownfield development next to the pad that produced most oil on the asset so i think there's a very interesting angle here that could evolve but you know that that's just kind of my personal view based on um, you know what what i think is kind of happening here but again it's just like one guy's view versus um so so let's look a little bit more about um i, I really wanted to share this so, so this is from 2015. Uh, so right now I'm sharing on YouTube Live and Twitter Live. I'm sharing some slides from Stat Oil Canada, Lismer Asset from 2015. So this is in the public domain. This is available for everyone to see. This is their disclosure on subsurface issues related and what, what they've done and the brief background, geoscience overview, drilling and completions, all the stuff that was done at Lismer. And this will really remove any uncertainty one might have with basically like, what is this asset about? Like look at the quality of this presentation, they provide background, they discuss details. Look at the amount of vertical wells, the animation wells that have been drilled, observation wells that have been drilled by Statoil. This is a super major from European, pad L1, L2, L3, look at, look at this. Observation wells everywhere, especially in the new LA field development. Um, the purple dots, observation wells, evaluation wells in, in black dots, uh, McMurray disposal wells, you can see them in, in the blue triangles. Um, just remarkable activity on the asset to, to really poke holes all over the lease, really to understand the, understand the pay. So when somebody says, oh, at the, oh, I'm not sure oil and gas investment, I'm really confused. That, that work being done, Th this asset is well understood. That's why when they went to LA, they knew exactly what they were doing. That's why the production today is at 20,000 barrels per day. Some quality of the asset depth. Uh, so they operate at roughly 424 meters on the ground. Uh, pay thickness, you can see LA to L1 to L4, about 22 meters. So, you know, it, it's okay. It's, you know, uh, L5, 19 meters, PED L6, 25 meters, porosity about 34%, very high uh, permeability of uh, 6 Darcy. So in the U.S. shale, uh, permeability is all in milli Darcy. It's like 3,000 milli Darcy or like, so it's like, you know, or it could be like 3 milli Darcy. It could be like, it's it's ridiculous sometimes, right? Because it's very tight, tight shale rock. Here it's like 6 Darcy. So 
in a very high permeability. It's almost like a sponge like oil. So you have oil and sponge and you heat it and it can drain where, um, where the permeability or, or, or the ability of the fluid to flow through the porous media, it's very limited. Uh, maybe on assets that have very low permeability, but here a very high permeability, very high porosity. Oil saturation on Bismarck, 87%. L1 to L4, 83% L5, uh, PAD L6, 86%. All of that work been done by Stat Oil uh, as this asset was getting acquired. You can see the development package here in L1, L2. Uh, the future development, the pad is going to sit on the south side of L1, L2. So that pad is going to really uh, kind of inherit a lot of the heat that was transferred to uh, to those reservoirs. So I, I think it's it's a good move. Geoscience overview, original bitumen in place. Look at the amount of holes that was poked in this in, on this asset. Just just remarkable. They have really good understanding of the area, of the volume, of the McMurray oil in place, everything. They they can quantify it. So when somebody says 30, 50, 60 years of reserves on an asset like this, where it's like a toxido cake, it, it's not like up to you know saying, oh, uh, Somebody guessed. There was a lot of money that was spent to to drill those delineation holes. Like th there was a lot of effort there to really understand this asset. And guess what? This is money that you don't need to spend anymore, right? So that that's exciting. And that bitumen isopop maps. So you can see here future development. I think this is critical slide to understand. Look where they landed before L1, L2, L3. This is the current production that be taking place. You can clearly see why they went to L8 on the north side there. You can clearly see it because that's where the pay is. And guess what? They're going to go a little bit more in northwest. As they continue to develop in brownfield development, they can steam from the mature pads that they've been uh, steaming for many, many years, likely putting a lot of infills, in situ co injection, maintaining pressure, and allocating steam to new wells with lower SOR as they continue developing the asset. So, I think it's very exciting. A little bit more here. Uh, pay structure map, so bitumen in place. Look, look at this region where L8 is located. There's no doubt to why the wells are doing the well, they're the way they're doing, they're producing 1,000 barrels per day per well. Um, it's because it's a very rich pay zone right there um, and uh, very much de risked. So, and even further for them to go ahead and drill the four wells this year and be like, okay, we're good. We steam them, we're producing the oil, let's do another five adjacent to them. Very conservative approach, watching every, I guess, move here to make sure that the wells they land are actually productive producing oil uh, at high rate. So I, th I think it's kind of kudos to them. And then again, I go back to the discussion and there was on Twitter complaining that the CEO gets paid a million dollars more than some other CEO or average CEOs or whatever. I think there was like even, a, and by the way, I have no, like, I'm not affiliated with management. I'm not affiliated with this company. I'm doing this for educational purposes only, just really trying to communicate why I think this company did relatively well. But I think it's a very naive way of looking at such good work, such good effort, uh, such professional activities and then going and not making or making an investment or advising other people on Twitter how to behave because a guy gets paid a million dollars more. I think we can do better as a community. I think I really think we can do better. Um, okay, going ahead. So this is some of their pays. So you can see really the geological zones here, um, where the sand is, where the mud is, where the oil, really good understanding. And you can see really the toxido cake in it and the exploited zones. So this is PED and L4 available in the public domain. In the public domain, each and every one of you can Google Lismer 2015 presentation, uh, uh, Stadua. So, and you'll get this. Again, well data types, uh, Lismer development data, core only, image logs, all of that work been done there since 2015 and available to the technical team to execute on. So there's seismic that was done here. I'm just skipping just some stuff because I really want to go to, to, to the core uh, message here. 
Another thing you can see here is the typical well pair circulation phase. So when you drill an injector and producer, you can clearly see, you can cement them. The technology that's used, it's a measuring while drilling, MWD. Uh, you need to establish initial communication between the well pairs because uh, the bitumen is at 14 uh, degrees Celsius. It's very cold, so it's like a hockey puck. And the pressure is very high in the reservoir because it just sits 400 meters on the ground. A good way to look at it is like, if you dive, let's say you go diving in like Mexico or somewhere, you will be adding like 100 kPa every 10 meters you, you dive. And so the pressure here could be as high as like 4,000 kPa, right? So very high pressure. But between those two wells, injector and producer, there's no initial communication. And so you need to circulate. So that's something that's called circulation phase. Right now, as we speak, L8, in my view, stopped circulating. This production will be coming online very soon on LA 2.0, which is the five whelpers. And um, yeah, so they circulate the swells, they establish the communication, and then you can see on the completion side, they introduce the ESP, which is electric submersible pump. Um, they, you can see their design, which is the production liner they have. Um, you can see the tubing, uh, the, toast, uh, the toast steam injection string right there. You can see the annulus casing and basically how they operate as well. You can see the completions. Now, why am I saying that? Because since 2015, since 2011, you can see on the slide of drilling and completions on the wellboard design part, they tried slotted liners, they tried flow control devices, which is FCDs. Uh, they tried orifice-based and restriction and balanced injection distribution for steam uh, management. They try different configurations and different geologies. Stat Oil spent a lot of money trying to optimize the swells and make them better, doing different types of completions. And um, what's really exciting about this is that this well's been producing for many, many years. And now you as management of Atabasca, you can go and like, hey, what, what completions work best? What did the... What did the, what pipes, what, what design worked the best for us? Uh, what was most ESP friendly? What uh, was the lowest steam to a ratio? Hey, sounds good. Let's do more of that. Let's do more of the good stuff that worked for us. Sometimes there is a big difference between saying, oh, I can try this. I'm going to try this concept. I'm going to do EOR. I'm going to inject a little bit here. I'm going to inject more. I want to try this. I want to try that. There's a big difference between doing that or doing it in 2015 and looking back re retrospectively and saying, hey, that was done and this is how it's done. And I want to do more of this and less of that. I think it's a very powerful concept that I don't think it's common knowledge, especially on Twitter. I think the fact that they used wire wrap screens, flow control devices and four whelpers here, four whelpers there and pad L5 and through burn school public domain, you can see exact production for the asset. I think there's real power in that because L8 right now is doing well for, for good reasons. And the good reasons is that they just did more of what worked. And that's a very logical step. Again, uh, circulation phase for L5 CD project, they tried different circulation methods and operational phase where they have production liner, flow control devices. You can see the 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 basically the diagram of everything. You can see the sizes, the the line hanger, uh, the you know the casing, the tubings, the ESP location, everything, and different things were integrated for different pads to come up with those conclusions. And everything is seen here. This is don't believe me. Look at this presentation. Don't even listen to what I have to say. Slotted liners, why? wire wrap screens, flow control devices, everything was integrated. But the core thing here that I wanted to share, again, look at the downhole producing instrumentation, lots of DTS, which is uh, uh, basically a temperature string. Uh, this uh, gives you good opportunity to understand uh, the temperature on the subcool, how you operate those, those wells, uh, whether you accumulate uh, liquid level at the producer level, how fast to drain the liquid level as you develop the chamber. 
all of those wells had DTS integrated by Stad Oil that when they acquired this asset. Amazing, amazing. There was a lot of money spent here, a lot of money, and a lot of money that doesn't have to be spent anymore. Different completions designs, everything here was done. And again, how how would you, how a typical person would know that, that this is valuable? I don't think too many people would know. Now let's look, um, yeah, seismic, look at this. You can literally see from 2009 to 2014, the steam chamber development through seismic that took seismic shots and you can see how the steam chamber grew and, and this is all production. You can see the steam injected, the bitumen production, which sections develop more, which develop less. You poked all of those holes everywhere initially before you developed the asset. As the asset was developing, you took all of those uh, seismics, the surveys of, of what you're seeing, and then you buy this asset, I don't know, for less than $500 million. You have those tax pools, you have those royalties, and now you're basically optimizing the asset and adding where something were worked on the money that you never spent. Amazing. And then again, look at the scheme performance. So this is Lismer performance presentation oil production. So in 2014. So what you see here is just a little bit less than 3,000 cubes per day. To, to go from 3,000 cubes to uh, barrels, uh, you need to multiply, multiply by 6.29. So let's say 3,000 barrels per day times 6.29 that's 18,870 barrels per day. Well, they're producing 20,000 barrels per day right now. So since 2014, they were essentially flat on the asset, right? And this is 50,000 barrels per day of oil injection with uh, SOR that is about four. But guess what? This SOR declined below three now, I think. So you can do more with that steam. And guess what you're gonna do more with that steam? You're gonna develop L8. So I think it's beautiful. I think, I think it's a smart strategy and I think they're doing quite well. So, so that's what when um, when people talk about basically thermal assets not having declined, there is decline, but it's a small one. But then once you kind of stop uh, producing, let's say that pad that you produce, which has maybe like four or five well pairs, uh, you conject into G and you redirect the steam to the next pad and you produce oil there. But so in overall in the overall asset, you basically don't see a decline. Lots of info here about the oil in place and the re recovery factor. Look, look at this. So L1 to L5, the predicted segregable recovery factor after 15 years is about 68% on L4 and on L2, 54%. So 54% of the oil you produce after 15 years. This is like in 2030. So there, there's a lot left for, for even the legacy um, pads. And I think that's that's the power with the thermal assets. So here you can see L1 production performance. L1 is one of those original pads. A thousand barrels per day, again, times 6.29, that's about 6,000 barrels per day uh, producer. Um, and uh, SOR, pretty good, 2.6, yeah. Uh, injecting 2,300 cubes. Uh, and you can see the well count. So we basically have seven welpers on, on that pad. And basically that, that's the template. So when, when I talk about you go to a tuxedo cake in Costco, you go to tuxedo cake, you pick your layer and you just template this. You just template, 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 and that's what you do. So when they say $145 million per day expansion program, um, sorry, $145 million, barrel, million dollars, um, expansion program, they basically, that's what they're saying. Hey, we're gonna just do more of that. And maybe they're going to put some infill, so that's going to cost less. But you, you don't really, like, this is, like, uh, kind of in line with the way my personality is because you just want to kind of go with the flow. You just want to chill. You just want to take it easy. You don't have to, like, really be on a treadmill to, to, to be stressed, to drill something because you have a crazy decline on, like, a, a logarithmic curve. This is very steady kind of oil production over time. But, again... Very important, you know, to know your geology, very important to know where you land. But guess what? I just showed you how much work was done to understand that asset. And you just basically keep templating uh, in adjacent to that. This is a very cool tool. This is temperature profile versus depth. This is indication of 
um, how the temperature propagates in the steam chamber. Um, this will not be intuitive for like, you know, non-educated eye. The, the angle here is that when you inject steam, and you operate above like saturation of steam, that's the, for the pressure. And the oil has to drain, I think it's about 70 degrees Celsius. So you could expand the steam chamber and grow, but you need that confirmation. Those uh, DTS and temperature sensors were integrated through observation walls by start oil. So everything is there. Amazing. And they, I think they've done that as well for the new pad that were developed. So uh, this company inherited it as well. You can see production from L2. Uh, this was a thing about 700 barrels per day, uh, 700 cubes. Again, you have to multiply by 6.29. So you can see the relative performance. Amazing. So they, they basically go pad by pad by pad and provide this information. So at this point, I will not cover every pad, but what I want to show you is the process facilities. And I think that's kind of where the value is, right? That, that's why I think when we talk about inflation, when we talk about building things, they don't build us anymore. Like there, it requires a lot of capital. That's why we talked in depth about post payout, pre payout. You need to make those significant investments to build those facilities to generate steam and ha handle emulsion in the back. Like look at the CPF plot plan diagram. This is the CPF census central process facilities. Look at this. This is like, I don't know, if they have $1.4 billion left to get to uh, post status on, on the initial investment, how much money did they spend on this? Two billion, three billion? Like they've been uh, basically making money because they survived as a company for what, at least 12 years now since that oil days and getting to this point in the CPF to be at $1.4 billion post payout, a lot of money was spent in this asset. And so you can see here what it was spent on. So you can see uh, through the second cycle on the simplified Lismer plant schematic, you can see you have the free water knockout facilities, the treaters, the deal bit, uh, the wet production gas that you have to handle, right? Uh, the sales soil coolers, uh, the dry lawyer from skip treaters, the skim tanks, like all of these things that handle all of this liquid and gas that goes in and comes out of the reservoir must be handled with process surface facilities at the central process facility. A lot of money and a lot of investment was spent on this. So now that you see this and you belong to a Twitter community that talks about this company or other companies in the sector, from an educative point of view, and somebody says a comment, oh, I think it's uh, I think it's garbage. It's it's a shit call. Knowing what you know and seeing what you're seeing right now with those investments that are being made, how can I take this seriously, those comments? Looking at this. So I had to stay true to myself and say, well, what's value? Is this valuable? Do they make this anymore? Uh, what, what's the, are they going to make those? Like, is this something that's going to happen more or less? And I'll let the listeners and the viewers decide for themselves. So I think that's where the, where the real value proposition is in understanding this asset. Now, why the title for the space and for the, the Twitter videos I'm making right now is basically that why did it outperform? And I think it's also outperformed because infrastructure plays outperform. Does this look like an infrastructure from this diagram, from the central process facility, like infrastructure play or not? This is the most complicated infrastructure one could think of and come up with. This requires a lot of expertise, engineering expertise, billions of dollars of investment per asset. It's very difficult to do this right now. International Petroleum Corp told us that they're gonna spend 30,000 per flying by 2028 to produce 30,000 barrels per day, a billion dollars. This company right now in a position to produce 28,000 barrels per day next year using everything that's existing. Um, and what's the cost of that? What's the value of that? So this is something for, for you to decide, especially that the pre payout status is $1.4 billion, which is very close to the enterprise value of the company. So th this is for me personally, it's very exciting. And that's why I really wanted to show this. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing this right now and share what Basically, they reported to AAR on uh, 
on uh, the value of the asset. So let's go to the AR. All right. Okay, so this one, um, Atabasca submitted to AR Lismer, Directive 54, Performance Report 2021. <clears throat> so everyone uh, on planet Earth could Google that and go um, and see the presentation themselves. So this is, again, educative purposes. You can clearly see the pads. Isn't it exciting after everything I shared with you to see those beautiful pads in the middle here of, of the Canadian kind of wild uh, no tailing ponds, no nothing. Those pads where once they're done producing, you can basically put the forest back and reclaim the earth. And uh, it's beautiful. I think it's a very smart technology that you know benefits benefits a lot of a lot of us. So how many people know about that? And you can see the central process facilities from Lisme. Okay, let's take a look again. They're telling you right here. The same first team, September 2010, 13 years ago, approved capacity 40,000 barrels per day, right? You can see the map that I shared so far from Lismer. You, you have the background, the pad one, pad two, pad seven, pad six. You can see the four whelpers that were drilled for pad eight. You can see the expansion for five whelpers that's going to happen. Eight producing pads, 45 horizontal whelpers, 15 infills. Uh, introducing more wells and pedal eight. This is last year, and drilling drilling more this year, and they're kind of done. I think they're basically circulating, just like what I showed you in the circulation design. They're going to be producing oil from those wells and sustaining their production. You can see their affiliations with uh, just getting the pipelines on the fuel gas uh, deal bit export to Enbridge uh, Chichum Terminal and supply from Enbridge system terminal on the diluent, which they dilute to transport the oil. You can see the, the liquid bitumen here in this picture. You can see the oil sand, what it looks like as a rock. So this is, looks like an asphalt in the water. I would say in this jar, what you see here is basically uh, emulsion, but re with very little water. So I think most of the water being removed um, and uh, because otherwise you will see a separation between the water and oil. Again, look at this picture. How can you not know much about this lease area with all those delamination wells being drilled? Not even by you. And I keep reiterating this because a lot of times uh, in oil and gas, there's risk associated with geology. But look at the significant effort that was done on that lease land to the de development area to really understand the geology and, and, and execute on the, on the pad, in pad integration. You can see the bottom water, water thickness map. Again, there's uh, around the pay area, um, there's different basically geologies. It could be a little bit water, a little bit gas at the top, right? So you have to manage the, the bottom hole pressure uh, accordingly. But you can see here basically that there's a little water there at the bottom. That's why they have to maintain pressure so the water doesn't come to the reservoir. Minimal gas thickness, so minimal basically gas uh, zones at the overburden level. Um, you can see in LA, maybe in the northeast corner, a little bit of gas there. So if, if they kind of reach, the steam chamber reaches the overburden, some of the gas could come up, come to the to the producer. But again, because they understand this asset and they did develop kind of this L4, uh, sorry, PET4, PET3 level, they could manage it a little bit better with subcools. And that was the function of that um, DTS that I was talking about, the temperature sensors that they can really tell what if things are cooling and how the chamber is developing. All right, seismic acquisition history. Guess guess where uh, the dates are from, 20, 2009, 2012, 2013, 2014. We know they didn't pay for it. At least uh, Stadwell pay, paid for it. Amazing, smart business, right? And inherited all this data to continue developing the asset. In a way, they paid for it because they acquired the asset, but uh, this big super major de it so much for them, which is great. You can see the actual pays, uh, pad one to pad eight, 28 meters, 29 meters, 26 meters. Think about this. 
your room right now where you see it, um, the ceiling is maybe like three meters, right? This is like 10 times that, 10 times. This is the pay of those reservoirs. The each ladder of a section could be 50, 100 meters long. Um, th this is the type of one reservoir we're talking about. And they have about, what, 45 here? Production history in 20, 2022. And again, we can start seeing the story here from 2015, what Stat Oil showed us. You can see here in 3,000 cubes, and we're still at this level. This production is flat. This production has been flat since 2012. It's been flat for 11 years. Look what happens uh, through technology and innovation. In 2019, in the purple line, gas injection rates. They start injecting NCGs, methane, non condensable gas, at 120 decks per day. So E3M3, uh, 120,000 cubes per day, we call it DEX. They start injecting 120 decks per day, dropping steam requirement to maintain the bottom of pressure significantly, where the steam injection rate declines from roughly 12,000 barrels per day, uh, sorry, cubes per day, right? So 12,000 cubes per day to roughly eight. So you have a saving of 4,000 cubes per day. What's 4,000 cubes per day? 4,000 cubes per day times 6.29. That's 25,000 barrels per day of steam. Now, if you have SOR of 2.5, you can produce additional 10,000 barrels per day just from that saving. Just think about this. This is uh, intriguing stuff, right? So basically production is flat, dropping steam requirement. Where is the steam going? Where is the steam going? This steam going to L8 while we're steaming all other pads. As you introduce that NCG a little bit more, you continue to develop your older pads that were drilled by stat oil. You take a little bit more of that steam and you develop another pad. This is how you go to 28,000 barrels per day next year. So fairly exciting. We're gonna see if we're gonna exit this year at 24, 25,000 barrels per day on Lismer. So I, I really think so. I think they can do it. it it's very uh, diverse here for them, but Again, I'm just a guy speculating here like everyone else. You can see the lateral length of, uh, of the wells. You can see the star going a little bit bigger. Uh, pad L8 um, going from uh, well pairs um, length 695 meters, 900 meters, 860 meters, some pad L6, 745 meters, some pad L2. They're going to 1250 meters. 1.2 kilometers each well, pad L8, five well pairs in this pad with expansion. Remarkable. So they're adding additional, what, 500, 400 meters of length to, to the injector and producer. Uh, again, we can see the oil saturation roughly 80%, the porosity 34%, uh, permeability in uh, X and Y direction is about, uh, on the pad L8 is six, where pad L7, it was 4.8. You even have a vertical permeability, which historically is much less than the uh, uh, lateral permeability. Vertical permeability is 4.9, which is pretty good. Net pay 25, 26 meters. Again, keep it in the, the context of your ceiling and your room where you sit. And this is basically a multiplier of 10 times. Cumulative production. Um, so for example, Pad L3 on cumulative production, they produced, uh, what, 1.8 million cubes. So that will be, I don't know, 13 million barrels of oil on one pad that they produced over the past 10 years. Uh, pad L1, they produced already 2.5 million barrels, a million cubes. So 2.5 times uh, 6.29, uh, I don't know, what, 14, 15 million? Uh, barrels they produced in, in this one pad. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that th this is not kindergarten. This is not uh, for a guy to come on Twitter and say, okay, this company, th this is a proven operation. This is manufacturing of heavy oil. This is what it is. This is serious hands, the risk through significant investment, through facility design, through implementation, through technology integration, 
knowing what they're doing. This is not uh, this is not kind of like you know amateur stuff. This is very serious, smart people, smart business people. Now you can see oil uh, versus steam injection rates and feds one to four, and you can see the wind down. Basically, they're going from six thousand cubes of steam, cutting it by fifty percent. Amazing. So that's a SOAR reduction. Oil is declining slowly, but you know you're going into wind down, so that's fine. Fed five six oil and steam rates. They keep in steam. They keep investing in those reservoirs that performing that younger wells. You want to grow the steam chamber. You want to continue developing it, and you're able to sustain oil rate at thousand cubes, which is close to six point six point three thousand barrels per day. Again, one point four NCG injection rates in SOR. You can see basically SOR um, decline from. 4.5 to roughly three, which is amazing. And as NCG co-injection been increasing, so they, they've been kind of, you know, sustaining the bottom hole pressure while reducing steam requirement. So this is uh, basically to learn more about uh, the facility. Again, you can see the facilities, uh, major equipment for expansion for 40,000 barrels per day. So again, you take the equipment you have and you kind of modify it to expand your capabilities to process more oil. You have the skim tank, the water, the filter, the pumps, the OTSGs that are in place, right? The free water knockout treater, heat exchangers. Uh, you can also see that some of the equipment has been installed. And so this is not greenfield expansion. This is basically um, allow your facilities to handle more emulsion. But guess what? As they continue to reduce SOR, as they continue to decline the water cut, they can handle more oil collection on the back end. Because the water cut really is in the emulsion, you have partitioning of water partition of oil. If you inject less steam, by definition, you're going to have less steam with emulsion. So you can process more oil, right? Again, look at the soil production over time since 2021, extremely steady, right? So 2.5 cubes per uh, thousand cubes per day. And you have the design that kind of gives you the limitation. You can get up to 4,000, right, cubes per day. So again, times plus six to nine, it gets you in barrels. And again, their development and all that, so which is great. Now let's talk about, um, okay, I'll stop sharing this. And let's talk about Q1 and what happened in Q1. And uh, yeah, I've been doing this for about two hours now. Maybe I'll spend the Q1 and kind of show line of sight towards, to answer the question where I think Atabasca outperformed. Okay, so right now, again, uh, for those on Twitter spaces listening to me, thank you for staying here with me for a couple of hours now. Uh, Twitter and YouTube Live is on, so you can see, you can always rewatch the YouTube and kind of, uh, I watch YouTube on double speed all the time, so, uh, because I know I can be a little bit slow, maybe in the way I think, you know, and there's kind of limit to how fast you can talk when you kind of adjust slides and read through them and trying to explain them. But uh, yeah, please adjust the speed on YouTube and just watch. My handle is Razor Oil on both Twitter and YouTube. Okay, so let's look at um, Q1 and what happened there. Because uh, there were some complaints about, hey, you're not able to generate cash flow at current prices. What's going on here? Let's address that. Okay. So, and again, not financial advice, but this is something to keep in mind, educational purposes only. Uh, talk to a financial advisor if you ever want to invest in these markets. Okay, so production for Q1 was 34.6 thousand barrels per day, 93% liquids, as discussed in what I showed so far. Uh, 29 from thermal and 5,500 from uh, conventional. Uh, the, main, the maintaining guidance, guidance for 34,500 to 36,000 BOEs per day. Now, I kind of call BS in that, I think. Because if you have 20,000 barrels per day right now in Lismer, and you're bringing those uh, five whelpers adjacent in L8, you should be in Lismer about 25,000, maybe 26,000 barrels per day at peak as you develop the vertical section. Because think about this, as you inject steam post-circulation, you get that initial flash of oil production. But then you inject steam on the vertical rise, you keep injecting steam, injecting steam, and it rises until the overburden. Now, every heat loss is heat loss to more oil. 
right? Because you didn't you didn't get to the ceiling. It's like in a shower when when you have steam. Let's say it's very hot shower and steam comes down and then rises. If you have a very high ceiling, the steam will rise and rise and rise and rise. But if you have a low ceiling, you need to call maintenance because now you damaged your, your ceiling. So in a way, every heat loss is heat loss to more oil. So that's how you achieve peak production in, in thermal. So if they say, okay, 1,000 barrels per day, five wells at least, because those other wells in LA, they were doing 1,200, 1,100. So you'll be doing here 25,000, let's say, in Lismer, unless you decline the other well pairs through NCG or some kind of late like. So let's say 25,000 in Lismer um, end year. Let's say hanging sun just hangs in, hangs in there at 8,000 barrels per day. So 33,000. Let's say light oil is just declines by 10%. Let's say, I, I'm not sure how it's going to decline, but maybe they bring another well and it, they just sustain, but let's say they decline 10% because it's conventional. So you get 25 plus eight, that's 33 plus another five at decline of 10% on the light toil, you, uh, you get 38. They're guiding 34.5 to 36. So, so where's the other 2,000 barrels per day, you know? So in a way, I think they're kind of de-risking here and saying, hey, hey, you know, we're going to keep, uh, maybe we're going to under, under, you know, under predict and kind of overperform or whatever the, the saying is, but Hey, maybe it is uh, 35,500 to 36,000. Maybe I'm missing something. But at the same time, as I understand those assets, as I shared this data from public domain, the story that unfolds here is kind of uh, shows a little bit more production, which is going to be very interesting because as we go into Q3, Q4, uh, we do see some rigs dropping. We do see Saudis taking a stand on, on July um, cuts. We, you know, we'll see whether what what the kind of geopolitical and, and the kind of those relationships and how they unfold within OPEC plus. And but in overall, the prices should at least be sustained here, or at least be a little bit higher, I assume. And we covered in a lot of detail here on what this company is free cash flowing as we speak right now. And so any any kind of WCS shock here. Uh, at five dollars, which we've seen, we've seen WCS differentials going from thirty to eleven, so nineteen dollars every five dollars. That's additional eighty million dollars to uh, AFF. Uh, and um, and yeah, it's going to be interesting to see, like because uh, right now, right here, somebody could say, well, risk-free GIC at three and a half percent, four percent, sure, but at the same time, if you start digging deeper it's like well what, what's really happening here is this valuable uh, 1.4 billion left in royalties uh, payout and in initial capex and the entire enterprise value trades at 1.7 there is another beautiful argument by people it says hey so if this asset was cheap uh, how come companies didn't buy it in 2020 when it was dying and the answer i give is that hey everyone's were dying like Everyone had debt. Everyone were not making money. The oil was minus 37. Majors, majors companies, uh, majors, like 30, 40, 50 billion dollar companies, EV companies, were trading at like $2. I think Meg was like a dollar. Sinovus was like 250 maybe. Suncor, I don't remember, was it maybe 10. So the last thing you would be doing back then was showing your shareholders how you acquiring stuff for cheap because you have no idea how long this environment will continue. You have no idea how long you can pay your own bills. Sometimes retrospectively, when you look back, it's like, oh, that, that was the obvious move. Why should you do it? But as you live in the moment, who told you that minus 37 is not going to last for two months? Who told, who guaranteed that to you? And what's your, um, What's your duty to your shareholders to take on more risk, to add more assets? So I think it brings another kind of interesting philosophical angle to, to the times when everything is collapsing. So in a way, I almost answered that question to, to the title of, of the space that they have on Twitter. And why did they outperform? I think they outperform because 
last year, instead of buying back shares and issuing dividends, they were reducing debt significantly. Net debt right now is about $50 million. So I don't know exactly as we speak in this day what it is. I know what they reported in Q1. And there's $173 million in cash, which is, I guess, 10% of your uh, EV. And that gives you flexibility. If oil price drops, let's say, or sorry, if share price drops, maybe instead of reducing that now, you buy in back shares. Maybe you have like a magical line where it's like, wait, that's that's where I'm buying. But maybe if they don't feel like they'll just pay down the debt and the, the free cash flow will be debt free and be done. And I think like within the context of everything I shared in the past two hours, if you have no debt with everything I showed here, how do you go bankrupt? I think it's very difficult to go bankrupt if you have like a valuable asset that right now, as we speak, free cash line, not sure exactly as we speak right now in this moment, maybe six, seven, eight percent, ten percent, but they are making money. And with the low decline on the asset, right, with the low decline that they showed, maybe instead of developing a pad, they'll be, hey, let's just postpone this. Let's not develop this pad. We're low decline. Let's put some infills here. Let's inject a little bit NCG. Let's run pop steam injection on this other pad. Lots of opportunities here. So I think in a way, uh, because the these names are never talked about, because nobody ever covers them in such detail, and there's very, very little understanding of the thermal business, even though it's one of the most major uh, businesses in the Canadian sector, because we have the third largest reserve in the world. And I think over 90% of that reserve is the oil sands, and over 80% of that reserve is in situ, which is thermal development. And this is one of those names that there were the only small sub names that are left. Everything, all, all other assets in the pre and post payout that I shared before, those belongs to super majors. They belong to the major company companies, right? The, those assets allows them allow them to generate the the free cash flow. They're always very proud of. And so I think this company is kind of outperformed because of those reasons. Sometimes again, I would hear, oh, uh, it's because maybe nine point is there that they owned it. Yeah, but nine point is there for a reason. Uh, nine point is there not only because. I don't want to speak on their behalf, but not only this asset free cash flowing, then you almost like when you look at 100 um, WTI, if, if you have the thesis, I think the AFF was like something like $800 million. And the free cash flow with the, as you take the adjusted fund flow minus the capital expenditure program, which was 145 million, you end up at like, I don't know, 650 million free cash flow. So you add 600 three times, you get 1.8 billion. Well, that's your, uh, that that's the pitch, right? That's kind of you. You basically can acquire yourself in three years. That's the pitch, but it assumes hundred dollar oil. Now, what if it's not hundred? What if it's eighty? What if you don't buy yourself in three years? Can you buy yourself in six years? Can you buy yourself in seven years at 80, 85? Sure. Are you under any pressure to to buy yourself out? No, why, why would you? But are you uh, the company that being portrayed on the way you've been looked at on Twitter by some people? I don't think you are. I don't think you are. And I think I showed a lot of evidence of that. Okay, so capital program, 26 million focused on Lismer expansion project and thermal oil. So that's basically a quarterly spend. Again, they're telling you where they want to do this. And the the expansion project in thermal oil in Lismar, the 26 million, is being kind of built on on everything Stat Oil already spent on all the delineation wells and all the vertical wells, all the observation wells, everything, all the equipment I already showed you, they're building on this. So there's this kind of hidden value that we don't see, but that money was spent. So capital guidance for the year remains at 145 million. So if there was a question about um, or worry about uh, inflationary pressures and all this, they're basically saying in Q1, um, no, we're going to still spend at 145 million. And again, 120 million goes to thermal, 25 million goes to light oil. Just think about this. Like that, that's like a fraction of what they're spending on thermal. Um, again, steaming commenced on five well pairs. And I showed in detail what the completion design looks like for circulation wells. I showed in detail what it looks like for 
operating wells. Um, exit rate this year, 24,000 barrels per day and expansion for 28,000 by mid 2024. Existing capital guidance, competitive capital efficiency of 14,000 per flowing. Amazing, right? 14,000 per flowing, 30,000 for greenfield, 60,000 acquisition, 40,000 expansion. Awesome. Um, okay, expect to drive margin expansion by $5 per barrel in Lismer. Operating income. Okay, so here, here's um, here's what was interesting uh, about this. So operating income was 57 million and 42 million, which was about 14.52 per barrel from thermal and 15 million, which is 30 uh, per BOE and light oil. Now, the key, and, and they speak in detail about the WCS differential that tightened significantly to, to 50 and now it's 11. Uh, and again, that that makes a huge difference there, right? Because the extra five gives you $80 million in AFF. Now from cash flow perspective, so th that was a big one. Now, now I didn't see it coming at all, but that's what they that's what they uh, said. And that would, if there was one negative, this would be it, right? So they say cash flow from operating activities was 21 million and adjusted fund flow, fund flow was negative 9 million. How is this possible? Now on Twitter, we've heard a lot of views Oh, that's the dealer. It's the dealer. The dealer cost was significant. Wow, dealer cost. Well, that was not that. The free cash flow that was not realized but was spent elsewhere was in fact in fact in fact 44 million that was spent on non-recurring financial adjustments. So that that kind of really uh, I rolled my eyes when I saw this. So what this essentially means is that they had a deferred hedging premiums incurred as part of the fall 2021 debt refinancing transaction. Remember, those guys like almost died during the downturn. And so that refinancing transaction have now fully expired. And as part of the efforts, so basically the saying, hey, we had to pay this fee, this financial fee for those kind of like uh, the premiums that were made. So. That, that, but that was the free cash flow for that quarter, right? That was the, the opportunity to buy back shares and all that, but they say, hey, it's not recurring. So I guess for next quarter, if we have WCX, WCS at similar levels, one should at least expect uh, that 40 million that was spent in the adjusted funds flow to pay some bank as a penalty to be realized in the form of uh, net backs. And again, if you make 40 million in free cash flow per quarter, that means you're making 160 million per year, let's say at those levels, not, not some imaginary levels, those levels, so WCS 57, 58, whatever it is. And um, and you're able to yield uh, just under 10%, right? On free free cash flow yield. So so that's kind of where, where they at. Um, and then they, they said that uh, they redeemed 50, 18 million dollars uh, Canadian in term debt and, and achieved the lowest level of total debt corporate history of, what 219 million so that's 160 million 162 million us they have liquidity of 260 million uh, i guess available to them but the net cash is the cash is 173 million canadian so now you take basically 173 219 so 19 uh, plus 27 um, what is that um, close to 50 million yeah so that's the net debt about 50 million where your enterprise value is um, uh, 1.7 billion. So, so that to EV ratio is basically a minimal here, right? Uh, so they initiated the buyback program in April, which I'm glad they did that because hey, you you kind of you have that cash, you um, you know you you can pay down the debt, but why would you? And but also you can start buying back shares. It's part of your kind of uh, you know return to shareholders, and especially now that you kind of positioned fairly well when it comes to netbacks, you, you, you line a site towards um, a field expansion strategy and sustaining production. So yeah, go ahead, buy back shares, that's great. So that's another issue people have on Twitter. It's like, well, you are diluting shares by paying uh, your employees and RSUs, PSUs, which is uh, like restricted share units, basically a bonus to your employees and management. Okay, so if you give $30 million, uh, at stock trades, let's say $3, you just gave away 10 million shares. And people get pissed off with that. Well, guess what? So I'm a corporate employee for 
a major producer, right? Uh, by the way, I got permission to to talk about uh, macro, um, uh, kind of oil and gas, energy related topics, uh, contributing community from my management, as long as I don't talk about the company for which I work for, which I'm re really grateful because it allows me to share those views, which I think is great. So I'm really glad, happy that my management allows me to have this freedom to to be also a good community member to all of you guys. So whoever is listening in spaces that, you know, just so you know that I have this opportunity and I kind of want to replace uh, my spaces contribution on Friday, Razor Fridays, and instead of doing stuff like this, because I think there is a little bit more value that I add. And, uh, and this way I don't have to deal with macro as somebody that more of a value investor. Uh, so, so that allows me to be myself a little bit more. Um, I, I know it's kind of rare and not typical that people don't trade, but uh, that's just kind of how, how I prefer to be. And it gives me a little bit more time on Friday to spend with my family. So hopefully you guys are getting a lot of value here. But anyway, so let's say they dilute and to that 580 million shares, they add another 10 annually because uh, they give their employees bonuses, which, by the way, isn't it great that employees can participate and take ownership in the company? I mean, I, I would be happy to. That's, that's great. At the same time, they repurchase and cancel 6 million common shares for $20 million. Uh, and so one complaint could be, well, why are you uh, basically issuing shares and then buying them back? Isn't it kind of counterproductive here? Well, first of all, it happens in every company, especially every oil and gas company. Like all, all of those companies will issue shares to their employees. And then if they buy back shares, they will buy shares. I think the key here is really consistency and also the concept of having that $173 million in cash, where let's say if stock was to drop to, I don't know, I don't see a scenario how it happens, but if it was to happen, let's say, and stock drops to $1.70, they can buy 100 million shares, like right away, and basically retire 20% of the flow. So this is just a like simplified example of something that could be, could be done. But then again, um, in this presentation, you see a lot of evidence that there is a significant amount of value in this very serious company that has a lot of very serious, significant, important assets that are very difficult to duplicate, um, especially today with high inflation and significant cost. Um, and so they're really positioned extremely well in, the, in a very interesting situation. And so they also, one thing that was missed uh, last quarter, is that they uh, they appealed their tax return for 2012 and they got $12 million back, deposited back for a reassessment. Um, so that's great. And they have 3.1 billion of corporate taxables. Uh, uh, yeah, which is, yeah. So I don't know. I think in the, the presentation they had a three and here it's a 3.1 billion of corporate taxables. What's the net value of that? Well, and I think it's about, uh, based on what Eric shared on BNN and Bloomberg is about 44 cents uh, per share. So it could be maybe 250 million. So then again, we go back to the asset value, 1.74 Lismer, uh, 0.2 in tax pools. So you get 1.9. Let's say 200 million for Hangstone, you get 2.1. And let's say a million, $100 million for conventional assets, you get 2.2, 2.3. Well, if you trade at 1.7 and you have $173 million in cash and you outperform pretty much every other company, there is a reason for it. There, 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 things just don't happen because somebody decided that, you know, there, there's actual physical asset on the other side. We, we don't have to speculate what is money. We don't have to speculate what's the function of Bitcoin in this game. We don't, we don't have to go to those areas. We can just see reality as is, and this is this reality, right? And so um, that that's it is how I choose to to look at this company. So again, what's their commitment? So they uh, committed to allocating seventy five percent of excess cash flow, adjusted five funds flow minus sustaining capital. Uh, again, uh, in numbers, uh, funds flow I think right now is maybe two twenty to thirty. Sustaining capital is maybe. I don't know, 125. 
So you have, and, and then with the $15 assumption on WCS, another $70 million. So we're 160 million, let's say. So 10% free cash flow yield. So it's okay. Buyback program commence in April. Uh, they're going to continue basically repurchasing shares. Um, yeah, uh, production guidance. Uh, the, the overall production is expected to, to grow by 5 to 7% through expansion plants in Lismer, light oil assets. So about 34 to 500, 34,500 to 36,000 barrels per day, 93% liquids, which is great. Again, I think there's a little bit more there, but we'll see. We'll see what, what's going to happen. They talk about capital efficiency in Lismer, but I think we talked a lot about that. Talked a lot about free cash flow, uh, minimal impact from uh, wildfires. And let's look here on the 2022 Q1, 2023 Q1. And maybe I'll, uh, I've been doing this for two hours, 20 minutes now. Hopefully you guys like it, but we'll kind of conclude with, with basically the production, the netbacks, and what uh, what could be happening. So again, um, produced a very similar amount of oil. Um, again, no matrices. matrices. Uh, and the netbacks, obviously, the realized netbacks were way less this quarter, right? So uh, the free cash flow was was negative for uh, for Q1. So, but then again, you know, um, it's kind of an interesting situation where I think there was this impact of Deliant as well, right? Where uh, operating netback was maybe $16, where uh, in Q1 2022, it was maybe $47 here in, in this example. Um, yeah, so capital expenditures mainly go into thermal uh, division. So Lismer, Hangistone, and Light Oil, basically the spending very little you can see a little bit more was spent uh in q1 2022 and uh on the cash flow funds again they had pretty bad quarter where on the adjusted funds flow um they did see that loss that was realized because of that penalty uh, but uh, what are you gonna do right so um anyway nevertheless the stock kind of continues to perform now you had uh, common shares outstanding. There is a big difference of 50 million. That's another pushback in the community. It's like, well, how come the uh, the stock outstanding increase? Well, you do have um, essentially warrants situation that was uh, uh, which could be a positive where you know you one exercise warrants and but shares must be issued in this case. And so again, we go back to this kind of thesis of hey, well, what, what's uh, what what could be done here when it comes to kind of buying back shares? Again, I, I think if if somebody is investing here based on uh, thinking that they're going to pay dividend anytime soon, that that may be not the way to go. But uh, I, I just hope they start kind of basically buying back those shares here. Again, there's 173 million dollars that you could do something with. I'm not exactly sure if they will be doing anything with that money except kind of maybe reducing a little bit debt and then maybe buying some shares here. Um, there's a lot of language here about uh, the plans for uh, the upcoming, but that coming years, the coming year. Um, just to conclude, light oil production Q first quarter 2023 average 5,500. Um, it seems like they, yeah, there's some details here about uh, what what's going to be happening? I guess with, with the wells, they to speak kind of that the light oil division generating operating income of fifteen million dollars, which is roughly thirty dollars per BOE, um, and capital capital expenditures of about two million dollars, and and lots of language here about Hangingstone basically continuing being on uncondensable gas co injection, and um, Elismer kind of going through that L eight. Uh, sustaining expansion and kind of having this line of sight towards uh, 28,000 barrels per day next year through the, the bottlenecking. And uh, I think it could be like 25,000 barrels per day, but that's okay because they're guiding like 35,000. So you get uh, 25,000 Lismer, 8,000 Hangingstone, another five. So you, you, you have this kind of buffer zone with maybe two, 3,000 barrels per day where uh, kind of uh, extra where 
where they could produce, but not sure why, uh, you know, they're getting lower here. So I'll stop sharing. Um, so in overall, I think to answer the question to how I started the space and how I started this live is uh, why I think uh, this company outperformed. I think it outperformed because uh, it's an infrastructure play. Uh, infrastructure names did extremely well um, last year, this year. Um, there's a lot of kind of um, angle here of inflation, uh, of prices increasing for different kind of, kind of things. Uh, we don't talk much, much about this anymore, but we did talk a lot about uh, this last year when it comes to um, pipe and materials and uh, increasing wages and stuff like this. And so uh, considering you have a lot of the things that are already kind of build, the CapEx was spanned, you're in a, in a structure where, uh, you know, you have uh, from a government royalties, you're paying like 3% versus other post payout assets, they're paying like 30 27%, uh, considering you have $3 billion in tax pools, but this not really $3 billion. It's about, I don't know, $0.44 uh, cents, uh, per share, which is maybe 200 something million. Um, so minimal royalties, no taxes, um, ability to survive in current prices, very valuable in infrastructure ability to grow production with minimal basically effort, very de-risked. Um, I think there is a lot of interesting nuances here. And so I think also there was a lot of, uh, that, that there was another important angle here. It wasn't that retail I think was kind of holding the line here. I think there was market transactions that were telling us that this is the cost per flowing barrel for which heavy oil thermal barrels are being acquired. I think we've seen that. Uh, and IPCO confirmed on the back end what it will cost to develop something. And those numbers were 30,000 per flowing on the development side, where you can produce 30,000 barrels per day by 2028, spending $1 billion. And on the flip side, we saw the Serafina Strathcona deal, as well as Suncor offer for Total assets roughly all of them were 60,000 per flying. And so I think there is this unique position for this company where it's located, where it outperformed. It could outperform, it could continue to, I, I have no idea. But I do know that from a royalty perspective, 1.4 billion on Lismer is very close to the $1.7 billion of the enterprise value. And so, um, it's a fascinating uh, name, I think. It's really uh, thought-provoking to think about how three years ago they almost didn't exist as a company. And the reason was because I think EV was something like 500 million or 600 million. And out of that, that was like $450 million, something crazy like that. And so your entire company, you're, you're basically the non-debt portion was like maybe 100 million because it traded like 15 cents or something crazy. But then again, there was no guarantee. Nobody knew back then that the prices will recover and the prices recovered very sharply um, as the inventories were declining and going in the opposite direction. And then with the SPR basically releases as we opened from COVID um, and we, we saw a scenario here where with the Russian war on, on Ukraine. We saw oil basically going to 120. And in this area under the curve between which we had basically oil going from like 60 towards 120 and all the way down to kind of 60, 70s, that area under the curve was the debt that was paid by this company. It wasn't the buybacks, it wasn't the dividends. It was all to reduce debt and survive. And so I think maybe, and if you look retrospectively, knowing we are where we are today, unfortunately, by the way, because I am an investor in the sector and we are in the $70 environment. If you look back retrospectively, this was 100% the right thing to do for this type of company. It was to reduce that. 
And uh, yeah, so I think in overall, the path forward is um, uh, the guiding 35,000 barrels per day production. We do know that Lismer, what's the value of Lismer? You know, one, one has to ask because that's their core asset. They're going to be at 28,000 barrels per day next year, probably 25,000 if they don't do development like it, but that's fine. But then again, the 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 concept here is not really that you have to acquire anything, you have to merge with anybody. The concept is in decades. It's like the, the reserves here are, I think the total is like 40 years 1P and like something like 100 years 2P. How do you value that even if you don't look at the um, kind of the, the narrative of you're going to be buying yourself in three years at $100 oil? which is based on those calculations and those assumptions, it's an absolutely accurate statement. Um, if you were to open a McDonald's restaurant today, if you were uh, to get like um, a license to be owner operator, you will pay maybe like, I don't know, $1.5 million in fees and, um, and basically work for seven years generating cash flow but then paying that debt that you took it will take you roughly seven years seven eight years to pay it back and then you can kind of free cash flow and pay yourself more if you look at this kind of company and the the ability of generating that much value in a very short period of time uh, in an environment where you you basically don't have those assets being built anymore as infrastructure assets. One has to wonder, you know, to, to the main reason why this company had performed. And, you know, it, as we look at MAG, as we look at Atabasca, for example, as we look at Synovus and others, we we are in this kind of no man, no man land zone in a way. And I'll explain why. Because let's say you look at MAG, and make trades at 100,000 barrel, 100, barrels per day, 105, something like that. Amazing company, by the way. And I covered Megan in my previous videos, and you guys can take a look. But your uh, debt, I think, now is about a billion dollars, and your um, uh, basically EV is like seven. So if you take the same metric, which is a very simplified metric, but that metric is indic indicative of what uh, um, what the market is willing to pay today. So if you have, let's say, a market cap of $6 billion and billion dollars in debt, that's $7, 7 billion in EV. You produce, let's say, 100,000 barrels per day, maybe 105. Yeah? I, sorry, I'm getting repetitive. But let's say you trade at 70,000 per flying, right? You essentially kind of getting to that um, evaluation of getting acquired in a way. And I'm just speculating. I'm just kind of trying to think about within the context of what I share, which is in public domain, and we all, we all kind of know what's happening. So what does it mean about assets like Lismer? Why why should you trade at 45,000 per flying? Why should you trade at 40,000 per flying? Uh, if you have expansion to 28,000 and your, you know, your EV now worth this one asset, but then you have the tax pools, the mineral royalties, the conventional assets, What's the value of this within this context, you know? And so I think with Meg, for example, because you have like decades, decades of reserves with very nice geology, with very nice netbacks, um, it, it puts this kind of, this within the context of like of time and value and how you basically kind of devalue over time and what it means for the market as you continue generating uh, free cash flow at even current prices, because remember, all of those companies made it from 2014 to 2020, surviving, and now they're coming here on the other side in within that kind of mini cycle that we had where oil prices were elevated and many of the companies chose to do whatever. And Meg did a very wonderful job with the way they kind of staged their allocation of the free cash flow where they, they really wanted to get to that target. I think it was like 1.7 and then they got to 1.4 and now they're trying to get to 600 million, but in the process, they're kind of integrating the buyback program at, at a certain percent. I think it's like 50% or something. So hopefully like this space and uh, this Twitter and YouTube live allows uh, everyone to have a little bit better understanding about the asset, about 
what they do, what they have. It was, I feel like it was a very deep dive to kind of the technicalities and, and the asset itself, the geology, the completions, the pad, the strategy on how they allocate. And in my mind, from a technical perspective, it was a fairly de risk name. But then the volatility in oil price really kind of creates this weird environment. And again, Q1 was very strange for me personally because I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not a financial guy. But yet there was this kind of fee that was um, the non-recurring fee that they had to pay because they had those issues with the banks in 2021, 2020, as they had to kind of survive as a company. Um, so in overall, hopefully uh, I did a decent job kind of combining, consolidating all of the data from the public domain and sharing it with the community. So thank you all so much for watching and listening, and uh, I wish everyone all the best. Thank you.